participation for all of you. One minute and we'll start, just five minutes to nine. Just one minute and we'll start officially. So, it's five minutes to nine. Uh, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure and honor on behalf of the organizing committee to welcome you to the first Varna DBS Symposium. In fact, this event can also be called the first Bulgarian DBS Symposium because it is the first of its kind in our country. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the form of the event will not be the classical one in an auditorium, but virtual with an online presentations and communications from Varna, Bulgaria, Czech, Hungary, Freiburg, Germany, and Novosibirsk, Russia. I'm happy to present to you our distinguished faculties, uh, which are world-renowned experts in the field of DBS treatment. In alphabetical order, this is Professor Istvan Balas from Medical University of Petsch, Hungary. He is a famous neurosurgeon. Professor Volker Kjönen from the Uniclinic uh, Freiburg, Germany, Medical University of Freiburg. This uh, uh, is one of the, probably the best German DBS uh, specialists in the field. Uh, neurosurgeon Dr. Uh, Natalia Denisova presenting the experience of the Federal Center of Neurosurgery of Novosibirsk, Russia. Uh, this is a wonderful, amazing hospital in Russia with a huge experience, neurosurgeon. Professor Norbert Kovac, uh, neurologist, our very precious neurologist, um, uh, professor of Medical University of Petsch, Hungary. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mikhail Tsauta, neurologist from Varna. And me will present our initial uh, experience from a, neurologi a neurological and neurosurgical point of view. This event is financially supported by the Ministry of Education and Science of Bulgaria uh, via the National Program European Research Networks. It's important to note that the establishment of up to date DBS Center in Varna is largely the merit of the former rector of Medical University of Varna, Professor Krasimir Ivanov, and the former director of University Hospital St. Marina and current rector of Medical University of Varna, Professor Valentin Ignatov. Last but not least, I would like to appreciate the crucial contribution of the members of the organizing committee of this symposium, not only for the implementation of this scientific event, but also for the creation and development of a complex modern center for the DBS treatment at the University Hospital St. Marina. Um, these are Professor Silva Donla, the current director of University Hospital St. Marina Varna, and head of the second clinic of neurology. Professor Ara Caprelian, the head of the Department of Neurology at Medical University of Varna, and also the head of the Second Clinic of Neurology. And Professor Anton Tonchev, which is the director of the Scientific Research Institute of Medical University of Varna, and also the head of the Department of Anatomy. Uh, also, I would like to, uh, to express my gratitude to the all members of the neurosurgical team for their diligence. Uh, so, now we can start, we can go further with the scientific program. First in the program, we'll start the program with the lecture of Professor Balash, the DBS for Parkinson's disease, surgical technique, summary of guidelines, and local experiences in Petsch, Hungary. Good morning, thank you for the introduction. Let me check the slides first. Can you see that? No. You must share. There, there is a button share. Yeah. At the bottom, when you have share, you can you must click on the screen that you would like to see. Oh. This is my share. Can you see that? No, I don't. Not yet. Hmm. I am sharing it. It was working last time. Share. Once again. Yeah, yeah. Right, we work. Yes, yes. It's starting. It's starting to share content. Is that okay? Yes, wonderful. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Sorry for the technical no. disturbances. So first of all, I would like to express my special thanks for Professor Enchev who invited us for your conference and webinar. My topic is the DBS for Parkinson's disease. And uh, let me start with some historical landmarks. Uh, as you know, in the late 40s, uh, the first human stereotactic intervention was performed and very soon after the German teams, uh, Spiegel, Hustler performed the first ablation in the thalamus and the pallidum. And uh, in the 60s, uh, after the introduction of the levodopa, uh, the side effects was resulted in a further surgical intervention. Uh, the repallidotomy was advanced again. And uh, because the bilateral intervention was uh, uh, carried by high risk of complication, in the late 80s, uh, the neurostimulation was the next step for handling the problem. In pathological point of view, you all know that uh, the dopamine loss is resulted in an imbalance between the basal ganglia structures and the motor cortex. And that's why three main uh, basal ganglia structures, the GPI, STN, and the motor thalamus, show the pathological activity. So these are the main targets for the movement disorders, especially for Parkinson's disease that I have mentioned. Uh, the ablative procedure uh, carries high risk, as I have mentioned, and it is an irreversible. And uh, you can see uh, one of our lesion making for a patient in the 90s. We started the ablative procedure in the mid 90s. So the DPS uh, uh, demands a new electrode design. So previously we applied the traditional cylindric shape uh, electrode designs and today the segmented electrodes provide a more specific uh, individual uh, spatial stimulation field. You can see the different type of electrodes. We also available rechargeable and non-rechargeable system. We all use the main producers uh, equipments and uh, the patient controllers, the controller for, for the doctors also available uh, all over the world. The on-label indications uh, are approved by the studies, uh, controlled randomized studies, and Parkinson's disease had an FDA and CE mark in the mid 90s for initially tremor and later on advanced uh, motor symptoms problems. Uh, we also have off-label indications which are not supported by randomized studies and uh, under research indication which is going to be the way of the future DBS technique. Let me share some uh, information about our department. So in the mid-90s all the background, uh, the diagnostic unit for image, uh, the stereotactic equipment, lesioning generator, the navigation system and the uh, micro recording system was available in page hungary and we needed to collect a multidisciplinary team who were responsible for the selection of the patients and also the follow-ups uh, this is just an information in in a statistical point of view up today we have implanted over 500 cases for different indications you can see the year started the different indications and also uh, the type of the surgery the targets so we have got uh, all together over 900 nearly 1000 electrode implanted uh, during this time and the deep brain intervention all together between 94 and today over 1500 uh, cases so what are our, our surgical techniques? Uh, we have got the radionics uh, frame system with the uh, localizer frame. After the fixation, uh, the patient is placed in the MR scanner. Uh, we, we look for the targets. So the main two targets for PD is the STN and the internal portion of the subthalamic nucleus, the most popular and evidence-based. And for tremor dominant patient, uh, the potential target is the motor thalamus and the zona inserta, which is exclusively uh, developed for tremor patients. Uh, potentially, there is another target uh, which has not been uh, uh, supported by evidences, the uh, PPN close, which is uh, 
indicated for patients who have got unstable freezing of gait and postural instability. So the target planning is uh, direct target planning. That means we have to visualize the target. This is the red nucleus, uh, the mammillotalamic tract and the fornix. Uh, we uh, have to gain uh, uh, contrast amperage and the SWI uh, sequence in MR to visualize the, the target. And uh, we have to make also uh, corrections. Uh, you, it, this is a higher magnification. This is the red nucleus. The software given coordinate is not accurate. So according to the anatomical landmarks ACPC, we have got a target point, which is not exactly overlapping with the, the accurate target uh, for the individual anatomy of the patient. And you can see this is the final target we have marked. Uh, we need the posterior portion of the uh, STN, and we need to place additional electrode around uh, the target. Uh, the trajectory planning was a crucial part of the surgery. We have to visualize the coronal suture. Usually the entry point used to be just two inches uh, before the coronal suture and uh, about the same distance from the midline. And uh, we have to be very cautious, just penetrate the middle of the gyrus. It is important, especially for those patients who have got brain atrophy. And we have to avoid the vessels, especially the ventricles and the subependymal uh, vessels as well. So how can we find the um, STN target, which is relatively small target, but we don't need the whole nucleus. We need just a part which is responsible for the symptoms, so the sensory motor portion, the posterior lateral part of the nucleus. Uh, since we have gained the information in anatomical point of view, we switch to the next step, the multimodal navigation. Next step is the micro recording. So uh, there is a possibility to introduce five parallel electrodes, but we prefer less electrode, the less micro electrode trajectory. Uh, resulted in less complication, it is our opinion. With the micro recording, we finally can delineate the, the nucleus, the neighboring structures, the border cells, and so on. This is a typical tremor case who uh, <clears throat> has got rhythmical burst activity uh, originating from the VIM nucleus, and this is the tremor sensor, just runs parallel with the burst rhythmical activity. And this is the GPI trajectory, what we are showing, the neighboring structures, border cells, external portion of the GPI, and the internal part, which is responsible for the symptoms, and the optic tract, we have to avoid damaging the optic tract and the internal capsule. And this is just an example, uh, three electrode and the red uh, channel shows the pathological activity. Uh, since we have the micro recording information, we switch to the biological mapping. We have to uh, confirm the evidence of symptom relief and uh, we have to avoid also the side effects. Uh, this chart shows if this STM stimulated in a proper site, uh, the basic symptoms improves. And in case uh, the stimulation spreads to the neighboring structure, we will have side effects according to the electrode placement. We prefer uh, making a straight skin incision bilaterally and uh, intraoperatively. We apply the C arm to confirm uh, the stimulated area. Usually, if we apply segmented electrode or directional electrode, the two middle electrode is placed into the area of interest. And postoperatively, always perform the CT control scan to check the trajectory and the electrode is properly placed. This is the electrode in, in MR as well. So the main indication for PD, you can see here, the motor fluctuation, this kind is a off time straight and refractory tremor. So these are the main indications for Parkinson's disease. And for those patients who respond to levodopa, more than 30% is a really good candidate for, for a DBS. Uh, the younger age is also a uh, good prognosis compared to the elderly patient due to the comorbidity, but the axial symptoms and signs are not expected to improve to DBS according to the experiences. This is just an example from the literature. 
to Penabi team who compared the three main targets, the SDN, the GPI, and the DIM. And uh, they found that uh, the SDN had the most effective, uh, uh, it was the most effective target for the basic symptoms, the dyskinesia, and also in view of levodopa reduction. The VIM target was exclusively efficient for uh, the tremor cases. What about the evidences? Uh, if you can see from the neurosurgery, uh, the systematic review and evidence, this guideline shows the, uh, the uh, result. Grade one, level one evidence support that uh, comparing the STN and the DBS uh, or GPI stimulation, there is no difference in view of motor symptoms according to the UPDRS uh, three scores. If there is the goal, the levodopa or dopamine reduction, the GPI or, uh, is preferable. And uh, especially if the patient has got medication related dyskinesia. Uh, if uh, we see the quality of life, also grade one evidence shows that uh, there is no difference if we stimulate uh, either targets. Uh, but if we have got concern about the cognitive decline or risk of depression for the patient, uh, the pallidal stimulation is preferable. In view of uh, risk of surgery, basically there is no big difference. Further evidences, according to the uh, studies, the Deutscher study, strong evidence support that the DBS was superior compared to the best medical treatment and uh, significant uh, improvement in quality of life in on time has been proved. Off time uh, can be reduced and uh, the dyskinesia are less severe if we stimulate the STN target. Also, if we see that the evidences, level B evidences support that in case of varying of motor fluctuation, peak dose dyskinesia and early morning dyskinesia, the bilateral STN is uh, effective. Naturally, there are so-called not indicated uh, accompanied uh, diseases, the psychiatric complications, depression, psychosis, dementia. These patients are not suitable for DBS treatment. Also, other vegetative symptoms are not responding to DBS. Uh, what is important in the time of the surgery, uh, in case the patient has got only mild the symptom, we have to accept the surgical risk. So that means uh, the surgery is too early. In case we operate too late, uh, because if we operate too late, uh, we cannot improve the symptoms like freezing, dementia and psychotic symptoms and postural instability, which is not responding to the stimulation. So the Moderate symptoms with dyskinesia and, and uh, bono fluctuations varying of this is the best time for surgery. If you see the early stem study when uh, randomized the patient uh, with optimal medical treatment and STN DBS, you can see the parameters of the patient. The DBS group was uh, more superior compared to the medical best medical treatment uh, compared. So the contraindications, we have got absolute and relative contraindications for the surgery. As I mentioned, the main cognitive disturbances, the de depression, psychosis patient are not suitable and also who is not able to cooperate properly. And uh, especially for those patients who are not responding to level of treatment. This is just the comparison of, of our patient who underwent uh, DBS uh, we compare the international and local data and basically in activity of daily living. The basic principle, and I was asked to, uh, to talk about the basic principle of the rigid arrangement, the stair tactic frame gives you the possibility to place a Cartesian coordinate system onto the head. And that gives you a reasonable accuracy of, uh, of around uh, one, one and a half millimeters to reach every point that is basically inside of the um, uh, of the frame space here. And on the left side, I've tried to illustrate how the modern stereotactic frames work, and they are typically center of arc systems. 
And those systems basically have a coordinate X, Y, Z and a target point here. And then you can play uh, with the arc or with the ring angles. And with playing with those angles, you will always reach this, um, this point, but at the same time being able to choose different uh, trajectories to the target. You can see here that is like the one of the typical um, uh, and most widely used uh, frames. That's the Lexel G frame. Lars Lexel has developed that in the late 40s, but he wanted to do uh, actually functional radio surgery with that. And you all know the story that Lars Lexel has then uh, developed the gamma knife for at first uh, functional approaches. On the right side, you can see what we actually do to to align our coordinate systems. You can see on the outside the frame. Uh, coordinate system X, Y, Z. And you, then you can see that there's another system that we ap uh, apply because we always uh, put a the ACPC system in place and express our targets points to a certain extent in mid-commercial point coordinates, MCP or ACPC coordinates, like we've already heard before. This might be, this might be an important thing because like in, in German language, uh, there's only the term Genauigkeit, but uh, but uh, actually in the Anglo-American terms, there's something that's called accuracy and precision, and they uh, need to be equally correct in order to be able to do good stereotactic neurosurgery. On the left side, you see, so that's the the, the bullet um, uh, bullet's eye here, the gray. So that's the target region, and you can see um, those. Um, um, those uh, placements here, or those shots, if you if you like, they're not precise and not accurate because there's not a good retest version because they are somewhere all over the place and they're not hitting and not placed equally on the gray on the bullseye. This ones here, they are uh, probably probably accurate somehow, but there is a huge variability of the target um, of uh, how the how the target has been reached here. In the next case here, you see there's a high precision, so a high retest repeatability, but you will always hit the wrong spot. But in order to transfer this here to this here, that's actually what you want. You need to know all our systems have a certain, um, a, a certain lack of accuracy, and you can actually uh, calculate for each frame the lack of accuracy. And Ludwig Zinsor has actually shown us very nicely 10 years ago how to do that, and then you will hit um, the pre precisely and accurately uh, the target region, and that's what you actually want. Now, I can skip this part with, because we've talked about deep brain stimulation, but let me use this here in order to show what the fundamentals and the ideas about what we're in Freiburg now doing uh, is. So you have that huge electrode placed somewhere in the uh, in uh, a ganglion or in a uh, cell group, nerve cell groups. So that's the nerve cells, and that that's the axonal structures and dendrites here. And most of them are uh, myelinated. And what you then typically do is you um, you place in there an electric field. And I've tried to just express that as a sphere here, which is certainly not correct, but it's okay for the for the picture. Um, now we we used to think because the the uh, symptom reduction looked very similar that we are doing an electrotonic inhibition of the target region. But later we found out, and that's basically um, uh, electrophysiological work, but also the work from um, from um, from the optogenetic groups around Viviana Gradinaro and Carl Dithrod that we're actually doing axonal activations most of the time. However, there's also a, uh, a some network effect when, when activating those axonal structures, and a lot of things need to be cleared up. But what we know at this moment in time, that typically axonal myelinated structures are activated, and then it depends on the environment. If you're in a, in a hub region or where you are, what the clinical effects are going to be. Now, we are coming from a world where we uh, typically look at gray images, um, certainly images that look a little bit like this on the left side here. You can nicely see uh, the subthalamic nucleus. You would find out where the dorsolateral um, uh, part of the nucleus is, which, you, which we think or which we know is the motor part. You can do higher resolution imaging now. Um, some groups work with seven Tesla images. This is an ex vivo uh, image from, from a brainstem. You can see how the preparated out at nine Tesla from the uh, Duvernois update. So we are used to do direct targeting to gray images. So that is something that has been, I was trained like that 
already at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. And the world, and we've heard the name um, Hassler from uh, Frankfurt, who worked together with Richard in Freiburg, um, he drew these nice pictures showing the uh, the topography of those homunculi in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And uh, for example, if you look at a region like the uh, like the posterior part of the ventralis oratus posterior nucleus here, in, according to uh, Hustler's nomenclature, and you see then the um, nucleus, uh, so the ventral intermediate uh, nucleus VIM, you see it here. And if you stimulate or do lesions there, you can nicely um, uh, get a tremor response. And um, I've tried to draw this here. So that has to do, uh, already has to do again with fibers. And at that moment in time, and that's again 12 years ago, we wanted to look, can we, can we see those fiber connections? Because we knew now that we would do axonal stimulation. Now the, um, the um, stimulation, sorry, the, um, uh, the fiber, uh, there's a lot of fibers in the brain. I'm just, I'm not going into this in detail, but I just wanted to show how many connections need to be respected. So um, it's probably in part pure luck that at the points where we are and um, empirical knowledge of many thousands of thousands of hundred thousands thalamotomies, why, why we can do um, a, a good uh, tremor improvement in that uh, plethora of fibers that you have in the Now we can do, we can do um, a measurement of the fibers uh, non-invasively. If you look on the left side here, you see a sphere. That is basically Brownian movement of molecules and the likelihood expressed in the distance those molecules would, would travel. So if you have no restrictions to other side, no gravity, a reasonable amount of temperature, then you would expect that the that the um, that the um, um, the likelihood uh, looks like a sphere. If you are in an axonal structure, then there's a restriction of movement to the sides. And in the longitudinal axle, there's a, a preferential diffusion. And that is something that you can actually nicely see in MRI scans. And you need to do a lot of MRI scans, at least six directions of those stacks here. Uh, but uh, but um, today, you would say you need more than 60 directions in order to get a good signal to noise ratio. And I'm in a, in a good appreciation of the uh, of the fiber text, and I'm just showing here in how many directions you actually need to scan the brain in order to get an idea. If you then have uh, the diffusion weighted imaging in certain directions, what you then need to do is uh, you need to recalculate that in order to get an appreciation of the fibers. And I remind you, this is only an appreciation of fibers. We're not directly showing fibers. We're only showing the, diff the main diffusion directions here. There's local approaches, there's, uh, there's um, global approaches. I personally think that the global approaches are the best ones to use. But for, uh, uh, for um, uh, surgical needs in most of the navigation systems that today have uh, DTI capability, they use deterministic tractography, which is a, glo uh, a local approach. Here's again shown what I showed before, and uh, the, the reason for the slides is to illustrate that fiber tractography can over or underestimate the size of the fiber tract, which you need to, which you need to really need to understand. This is not anatomy, it's infrastructure of anatomy, it shows diffusion, but you can draw conclusions on anatomy. We're not the first ones to use this in tremor. Um, uh, there's other people who have looked at the parcellation of the of thalamus um, already, and they have already shown the dentate rubothalamic tract, also not, not basically like directly naming it like that. That's work from uh, Tim Behrens and uh, Heidi Johansenberg from 2005, and I just wanted to show that we're not the first ones. However, we were the first ones to show that the dentate rubothalamic tract uh, identifies the tremor-reducing region of the thalamus. We do not know at this moment in time if the DRT only enters the VOP nucleus, or but, uh, but like like there's uh, the the publication by Samartino in um, to um, in uh, from the Toronto group, and they said uh, this identifies the VIM nucleus. I'm not quite sure that this is correct. I think this more uh, identifies uh, the VOP nucleus, but this needs to be elucidated. But you can track, you can target those fiber structures if you know the reasonable accuracy of what you're doing. And there's actually histological proof uh, about the correctness of this approach. Uh, this is a very nice um, paper from 2016 where they did ex vivo 
um, studies and uh, overlaid that with tractography, which they also read, uh, did on the dead brain. So that's a very nice um, anatomical proof that at least the projection that we show they are crossing, uh, they are correct. And that leads us to uh, limitations of the approach already. The deterministic tracking has a hard, hard time to show the crossing of the DRT. And we know that uh, there needs to be a crossing of more than more than 70% of the fibers. And the track actually comes from the dentate nucleus. Most of the fibers cross under the ruber here, follow the superior cerebellar peduncle, are actually the main fibers that form it, cross to the other side, go along the, the ruber, enter the thalamus at this level here, and then there's a synapse, and then it goes further with the salomocortical tract, and we've named that altogether the DRT, dentated with thalamic tract, or DRTT, as you sometimes uh, find. Now, um, I'm a little bit running out of time, so I'm trying to speed up a little bit. Uh, we have shown that if you do traditional WIMS, um, VIM surgery, so traditional weight thalamic surgery with testing the patient, and then uh, at the end uh, compare that with uh, DRT rendition, then you can find that you will get moderate control if you're too far in here, and a very good control if uh, the stimulations of those 11 patients in this group here and shown on the group level is basically located in that anterior third to anterior half of the DRT. That is, appears to be a very good thing. Again, this is not like a new idea. We're just visualizing ideas that our predecessors and colleagues before had. And they were uh, thinking about that from the subthalamic region, uh, fibers fan out, out of the caudal zona and zerda and the, uh, the posterior subthalamic region into the VIM nucleus. Uh, we've at that moment in time already expressed the idea that um, we would have uh, one fiber track that connects all of the stereotactic uh, targets, which we, uh, which most of our colleagues today um, uh, agree to. Others have reproduced that you can use the DRT as a direct uh, targeting method in order to get good tremor improvement and find alike um, 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 results for tremor surgery if you do DRT or VIM surgery. Um, I've tried this, but I'm not getting uh, my videos to run. But what this case wanted to show is that uh, we had a patient who had a um, who had a, a, VIM, uh, a VIM uh, stimulation at a, at a um, uh, remote institution, and he came to us because he had no good tremor control of his trunk tremor. So he had a very close to midline tremor, and we implanted him DTI assisted uh, in more uh, more deeper in the caudal zona and sorta, and had a very very nice tremor improvement. Um, of this year. And you can actually see exactly what I've been expressing. So the VIM nucleus, uh, it appears to be, it appears to be projecting more also to supplementary motor regions. So that's the motor cortex supplementary and a little bit uh, further. And in that second uh, stimulation, which is then shown in orange here on that Mercator projection, you see how we typically devote our stimulation to the motor cortex and actually also a little bit to the parietal, to the, the postcentral. Now I'm. Um, I will try. I will try to uh, to wrap up because I'm running out of time. As I said, we've done a further study where we compared um, a DRT stimulation in the subthalamic region and in the thalamic uh, region. Did that in prospectively in 37 patients, and the idea was that um, if you would, uh, if you are in the vicinity of the target region, and that's just a cross section of the DRT here, you will probably use a lot of current in order to, um, uh, to stimulate that region and to uh, get a tremor improvement. But if you are in the middle of it or right, right very close to those fibers, you will have less current. And we use that in order to uh, define a measure of e e efficacy. And that measure of efficacy, we, we simply call ticker, tremor improvement to current ratio, which means the tremor improvement on the table rated by zero to three, three being full improvement, two being 50% improvement. And uh, if you do that, uh, and you then um, um, differentiate that uh, with the milliampere that you use or divide that uh, with the milliampere use, you will get the ticker. And like full improvement here, uh, you had a ticker of 0 0.75 per milliampere here, three. So that's just like an efficacy measure. If you use that and you do that in uh, in more than 200 stimulation points over a group with heterogeneous tremor, you see that um, uh, that uh, the best tremor improvement you achieve if you're on those red diamonds, and the red diamonds actually mark 
where uh, the dentate ribothalamin tract is located. You can see if you stimulate in the VIM region in the same patient and you stimulate deep, deeper, you will get a good tremor improvement down here, but need lot, a lot of current and get a better improvement with subthalamic um, uh, stimulation, uh, so subthalamic region stimulation, and that has been nicely uh, replicated also by others, by a lot of groups. Um, I would uh, name um, the group from uh, from Umea, um, uh, who nicely have shown that that better improvement is seen uh, in deeper target, and that's probably owing to the uh, effectiveness of the uh, of the fibers that are very dense down there. We could uh, then uh, actually in this analysis for each, um, uh, actually for each disease, maybe not for tardive dystonia and infarction, we could show that the DIT is the causative agent uh, for tremor improvement. Um, um, and I will, I have some more slides, but owing to, and I want to be polite and, and not um, uh, extend the time here. So, uh, what I've now shown is that um, you are able to use uh, a technology like the diffusion time, the imaging tractography uh, to define target regions, maybe to redefine target regions, to understand more about uh, the targets um, um, that, you, that you basically um, can use. Um, for the DBS approach, maybe the last thing that I'm showing um, here is there is a little uh, there is a little debate going on um, about um, are there actually three subdivisions in the primate uh, subthalamic nucleus? We've actually, uh, if you look through the literature, and I've done that uh, because of recent publication, you can see that there's uh, more than 50 papers written on that topic. And what we today use uh, in the in the subdifferentiation of the subthalamic nucleus. Talking about the limbic associative and motor SDN is probably not the anatomical uh, right thing. That is hard. That is very, very driven uh, by uh, by stereotactic neurosurgery by the use of the nucleus. And um, you can use tractographic technique to show a subdivision and to show that there's freedom. We're going to talk about that in the in the next talk. But what we are doing at this moment is. We use um, patient individual uh, DTI, so that's one patient that we're showing you actually, and we try to show the differentiation of the projection from the target region. Um, uh, we show uh, in a color map that you can then use for targeting um, uh, in order to show the three different patient individually showing the three individual parts. Um, of uh, the subthalamic nucleus, uh, namely, uh, then again, something that looks like a connection to the frontal lobe that is probably uh, limbic, then associative, which is more in the direction of premotor and then uh, into the motor part. So that's that's something that we are currently researching. And this is one of the cases that we have done where we've actually uh, changed uh, the stimulation and actually showed some improvement, but that at this moment is um, is a work in progress, but our idea is that using the DTI approach in something that you can easily fit into your uh, planning system will help you uh, to differentiate and to make patient outcome better. Um, with this, I would like to close. Thank you. Sorry for being a little bit over time. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Professor Kjolan, for the very nice and very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, congratulations for your contribution to the field of this uh, of this uh, 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 future imaging strategies. I'm sure that this will improve in the future the quality of life of our patients. Unfortunately, we, we don't have any time for questions, but if some of you wants to ask something, please. Uh, it's a very interesting, it's very interesting job. Dr. Deniso, please. Uh, Professor Conan, thank you for your very scientific and interesting report. So I have a question about side effect of stimulation of this DRT. So uh, maybe you have already experienced, uh, because early or late, uh, all patients with DBS B uh, will get dysarthria. Is it the same with DRT stimulation? Um. I, I cannot really answer this question, but in our patient that we talk with DRT, we see the same problem. We we have a, a research branch looking at that, uh, but but you have to understand we're not doing we're not actually stimulating a different region. I guess I think what we're doing is we try to patient individually identify the region. So it's very very likely that we will have the same side effects. And you're talking about 
that a stimulation induced um, uh, cerebellar syndrome that can have um, cerebellar uh, tremor later that will uh, result in ataxia and all that. Yes, we have the same problems and that is not solved by using another te imaging technology, I guess. Okay. Uh, your microphone. It's muted. Professor Bosch, if you have any question, a question, your microphone is muted. There is a button below. Yes. And now? Yes, it's okay now. Okay, thank you. Just uh, from, for okay. Professor Conan, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, sometimes the VIM target is not easy because you cannot delineate an MR scan, brain scan, comparing to the STN, and uh, not easy where to place the electrode. And uh, do you exclusively place your final electrode according to the tractography information, or do you apply intraoperative stimulation as well? Or if you uh, apply both, uh, which one is uh, the most preferable? So my, my clear opinion is that the preferable is the uh, is the electrophysiological response. So um, you want to know if the patient reacts because this is an imaging technology that could be that could have errors. The problem really is that we have uh, prelaminiscal radiation fibers in the back of us, and then we have also uh, medial lamniscus even in the back of that. And it could be that the algorithm actually um, hops on those fibers and actually not always shows. Um, uh, the DRT depending on the technology that you use. So typically what we do, we choose our initial target based on MCP coordinates, refined by DRT, but then do intraoperative technique, mm -hmm. uh, stimulation technique. So always check. We have a, I have a research study going on where we do in 12 patients an, uh, a sleep stimulation. We did that yesterday and in 12 patients, the, uh, the normal stimulation with uh, the, the awake um, surgery with testing the patient and we will compare them in an inferiority approach but um, uh, clinically uh, if the patient um, um, stands the stimulation procedure which they normally do we would always go for a stimulation on the OR table which I think is still ground truth and gold standard yeah thank you Okay, thank you for the questions and for the answer. Uh, Professor Coach, I beg your pardon for the delay, but you will have your time for the lecture. So the next lecture is the deep brain stimulation can preserve working status in Parkinson, Parkinson disease by Professor Norbert Coach from Medical University of Petch, Hungary. Uh, he's a very re well-renowned neurologist. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be invited in this, uh, hopefully not the last, but uh, the first uh, Varna uh, DBS Symposium. Can you see my slides or? Yes. Okay. Um, so I would like uh, to start with my disclosures that uh, according to this study, I don't have any financial disclosure. And uh, I would like to talk about, from a neurological perspective, can you see the slides? Yes, it's okay. okay. Uh, from neurological perspective, that uh, deep brain stimulation is, is very important uh, to treating the movement disorders, especially Parkinson's disease. Um, like the previous lecturers, I would like to also start with a historical point of view. This is less known that uh, the first description of the four cardinal symptoms, tremor, rigidity, bradykinase, and postural instability was uh, published in a Hungarian book in uh, 1690. Uh, Papa Iparis Ferenc was one of the best known uh, medical doctors at the time. Unfortunately, he published his experience in Hungarian, so that's why it was not internationally recognized, but um, he was the first, probably in the world, who made a publication on the clear uh, clinical factor uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So going back to the topic, I'm a neurologist and I would like to care about my patients. And you know that the course of the Parkinson's disease is very long. It starts pre-clinical stages, it can last 
or a couple of decades. And we can diagnose at the moment Parkinson's disease by the motor symptoms. Many patients have one or two years until uh, they are recognized as a PD patient. And in the early phase of Parkinson's disease, the um, symptoms can be controlled quite well with oral medications, sometimes monotherapy, sometimes combination therapy. And later on, unfortunately, uh, the efficacy of uh, oral drugs vanishes and wearing off and motor complications, on off fluctuations, this can kind easily of develops. And this is the cause of Parkinson's disease, which at the moment cannot be uh, improved. We don't have a therapy to slow down the disease progression, and we don't have a single therapy which can uh, prevent the motor and the non motor complications and the worsening and uh, the development of levodopa resistance symptoms. So, as a neurologist, I would like to highlight that not that the motor symptom, but the social occupational functioning, the health related quality of life of the patient would be improved. In the first uh, years, many of our patients, especially the young patients, have uh, good working abilities. And as the disease progresses and the symptoms became worsened and the efficacy of the oral drugs vanishes, sometimes they lose their working abilities, but our aim should be the first to improve the social occupation or functioning of the patients. If the patients want to be uh, active and uh, want to work, we should try to uh, the best medication options or the treatment option to preserve their working abilities. Uh, this is a very old slide. It has been published 14 years ago by NHRAC, and I think there are too many papers on that, uh, that Parkinson's disease produces early retirement and uh, worsening of the social occupational impairment. And many of the patients who develop Parkinson's disease lose their job in five years after disease onset, and if the PD patient is young, less than 45 years, it can be a little bit longer. If the patient is over 55, um, it's much shorter, sometimes one or two years when they lose their job. We know that deep brain stimulation, as it was highlighted by Professor Balaj's lecture, is, is uh, um, class uh, 1A treatment of uh, Parkinson's disease. We have lots of multi-center randomized control trials, for instance, the German and the US-based trials, they use a subthermic DBS or the combination of subthermic DBS and GPI DBS. And what they found that uh, the motor improvement of the patients can be dramatic. If we look at, for instance, in the German study, led by Professor Deitcher, the motor score improvement is approximately 20 points. It's a huge and dramatic improvement in the motor symptoms. And this is associated by a large improvement by the quality of life scales in the PDQ39 or PDQ8 scores improves also uh, approximately 10 points. So we do have a very huge and very dramatic uh, efficacy in the case of S10 DBS, if you look at uh, the meta analysis, we can see that uh, nicely that all the studies are congruent, that uh, DBS stimulation has a very huge and, and uh, highly effective uh, efficacy on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If you look at uh, the guidelines, for instance, uh, I included the Movement Disorder Society guideline, which was published a couple of years ago. It's uh, repeated the same, that deep brain stimulation is recommended for drug-resistant tremor and motor, and probably no motor complications for the patients if they cannot be treated orally. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, the concept of early steam is that if we do have a very nice and highly effective uh, therapy for Parkinson's disease, why should not 
we deliver this therapy in the earlier stages. I would like to show two of our patients who are relatively young, around their 50s. They were operated two years prior to videotaping for deep brain stimulation. And what happened? Both of them have a clinically good motor outcome, but one of them became a care home resident. The other patient who was operated 10 years ago, still active, and uh, he still works as an electrician. So what was the difference between them? Uh, the patient who was uh, presented on the left side was operated when he lost, lost his job and he lost his family. On the patient on the right side, had an active job and he kept his job after the deep brain stimulation. As Professor Baraj has highlighted, the key question is when should we operate the patient? If we operate too early, that give, uh, it, it is probably not good because we put the patient on the risk for surgical bleedings, infections, and hardware related problems. If we operate too late, sorry, uh, then postural instability, freezing, de dementia, psychotic symptoms, which are commonly called as levodopin resistance symptoms develop. And in that case, the DBS efficacy is much limited. So we have to operate the patients between uh, the beginning and the end phase. And this is, I think, the most important uh, question from neurological perspective. Even in the early uh, 20s, um, Professor Anton Lang, who was at the time uh, the leader of the movement of the society, published a, a, a viewpoint article that the sooner can be better than later. So according to this um, idea that we should operate the patients earlier than when we operate at the moment, and probably they could have a better outcome this concept was um, included in a so-called early stem study, and I think it, it's very controversial study, but it's very important in the field. It was uh, including a relatively large number of patients. More than 250 patients were randomized, either to receive deep brain stimulation or best medical therapy uh, in very highly clinically experienced and recognized centers. The inclusion criteria was very different from the everyday. The patients were young, less than 60 years old. They had relatively shorter levodopa-induced motor complications, lasting less than three years. Their hernia stage was relatively uh, moderate, less than three points. And they had a preserved social occupation of functioning. And I think what is uh, the, one of the important finding of the study that the primary outcome was not the motor scores, but the PDQ-13 is the health-related quality of life index. And what they found that was very impressive, those patients who received best medical treatment had more or less stable health-related quality of life. If we consider that these patients had the fluctuations, and they were treated with best oral medication for two years, it's, I think, a relatively good outcome. But those patients who received early deep brain stimulation, it was septamic deep brain stimulation, they had a dramatic improvement, more than 26%, uh, percent, and this lasted for two years. So the conclusion of this early stem study is that uh, in highly selected and individual cases, young patients with preserved social occupation or functioning, deep brain stimulation is not non-inferior, it's superior to comp uh, comparing to the best uh, oral treatment. However, lots of criticism has been approached uh, to this uh, treatment. One of them is that the nocebo effect Nocebo means that we can assume that those patients who did not receive DBS, but they wanted to have DBS, they're saying that best oral treatment is worse for them. So probably this is one of the most important conceptual problems. But if you look at the viewpoint articles from highly ranked centers, for instance, 
from Pro uh, Professor Lang, they also claim that early steam is not for everyone. It's for the highly selective patients. So in page, we try to replicate, but a little bit differently, the study, we collected our patients who were young enough comparable to the early steam study. And uh, we compared those patients who had a job prior to the operation to the outcome of those patients who lost their job before uh, receiving DBS. And what we found, uh, the baseline characteristics, the UPDRS scores, the age, the disease duration, the EQ5, the disease uh, has rated quality of life, it were comparable. And what we found two years after the operation, those patients who had an active job at the time of surgery, had a better health rated quality of life after the surgery, even though that the motoric symptoms were comparable in the two groups. And I think it's very important from economy and society as well. Many of our patients who were active at the time of surgery, 80% of them were able to maintain their job. So I think it's a very important message that deep brain stimulation is a highly effective treatment for Parkinson's disease. The DBS should be applied in individual cases, especially to uh, very, uh, the individual, those patients who have an active life, who are young enough uh, to try to improve their uh, health rated quality of life and help them to preserve uh, the uh, working abilities. For instance, in page when we started uh, the DBS, the average disease duration was more than 15 years. Now we operate the patients from eight and nine years of disease duration. So individual decision is needed. And I think we always have to think about the patient as what is his need. If he's a good candidate for DBS and has a disabling, but not too severe, motor complications, DBS can help them to uh, maintain their working abilities. And I think the most important key is the right patient selection. And for patient selection, the team, including neurologists, neuropsychologists, a pediatric neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, PD nurses, and also neuroimaging techniques are warranted. I would like to thank your attention. If you have any question, just let me know. Thank you so much for this interesting and very meaningful lecture. Uh, any questions from the colleagues? So we'll go further with the with the next lecture. Uh, this is the deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease patient selection and initial experience in Varna, Bulgaria by Dr. Mikhail Tsalta from our university hospital. Dr. Tsalta. Hello, and uh, thank you again for the invitation. We couldn't see you. Could you please switch on your, uh, start on your video? Yes, it's nice, perfect. Yep. I hope you can see the slides. Okay. So, as an introduction, uh, we don't have um, any registry about Parkinsonian patients in uh, Bulgaria, but yet with epidemiologic uh, data, about 13,000 patients are with this disease in Bulgaria. And uh, as you know, there are two centers, one in Varna and one in Sofia, and we expected only patients from the eastern part of Bulgaria, but actually we have uh, from much bigger part of uh, the country. In 2018, actually, the multidisciplinary team for deep brain stimulation was formed. Of course, uh, these are not the only participants. We have um, radiologists, uh, nurses, uh, which also help. And this is the timeline how everything uh, went in Bulgaria. First with uh, two trainings, one in uh, Bern, Switzerland, after that in 
Apex and uh, Budapest, Hungary. After that, we had a lot of time to wait uh, for reimbursement of uh, devices and actually the first uh, surgery. And at the moment, we have uh, already six patients who are on DBN stimulation and uh, six more who are awaiting for uh, their uh, DBS implantation. So it's hard to talk after uh, such uh, good lectures about uh, targets, uh, you know, uh, them and the internationally accepted uh, indication. But again, we have to highlight uh, that GPS should be uh, done in a certain um, part of the time. And uh, the best thing is uh, that the patient is getting informed in the fifth in the five years after the um, diagnosis so he can think about these therapeutic options and uh, here are the uh, local criteria in bulgaria uh, the patients must have at least five years duration of parkinson's disease presence of severe uh, symptomatic lack of effect of uh, optimal peril uh, medication duration of off periods more than two hours dyskinesia of course uh, we should highlight uh, the absence of cognitive and psychiatric disorders and other significant diseases so uh, here's uh, the way of uh, the patient first patients are screen being screened by general neurologists or uh, neurosurgeons then they are referred to the dbs center for consideration where uh, we generally divide the patients in good candidates and uh, those who are poor candidates for the procedure. And after that, the decision for the procedure is taken. Uh, of course, uh, there is no internationally accepted preoperative uh, screening protocol. So each center uh, prepares uh, one for uh, the center itself. So we start with the clinical evaluation. The first thing uh, is, again, to verify the diagnosis of uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but not um, Parkinson post syndrome. So we have uh, to wait at least five years for this. And uh, again, the level of a challenge is uh, crucial for this um, because we have to investigate the patient in his best on state. And uh, after that in off state with uh, withdrawal of uh, level of medication for 24 hours and at least 48 hours for dopamine agonists. After that, uh, we should again verify the major indications. Uh, early steam is, uh, as uh, Professor Kovac said, in order to preserve quality of life, but it is not an option currently in uh, Bulgarian, and we have to judge for. Um, a large number of uh, possible contraindications in each patient. After that, we have to make a detailed explanation to the patient and uh, his relatives so they can have uh, realistic expectations for the procedure and uh, the symptoms uh, which can be improved and their goal. What uh, samples, electromyography, uh, where uh, you can see in tremor uh, predominant form the classic pattern of uh, Parkinsonian tremor. That scan is an option in order to determine the uh, Parkinsonian uh, syndrome. And of course, uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging where the most important um, sequences are uh, T1 with uh, contrast and SWI in order to uh, have a good image of the basal ganglia as well as um, the field of view. It should be large enough with, uh, with all the structures of uh, interest. And uh, here is how the T images uh, works on 1.5 uh, Tesla MRI and uh, the SWI images on uh, 3 Tesla MRI, where we um, should focus for the red nucleus and uh, substantia nigra. And after that, we start with uh, different questionnaires, measuring tools in order to um, check the severity of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. These, uh, these are the um, MDS OPDRS score, where uh, the third part, the motor part, is uh, the most important one. 
after that we have uh, modified shop entry contact with a daily uh, living scale quarantine yard scale which is actually not in contraindication but all the patients uh, currently are with uh, 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 third stage at least non-motor symptoms uh, parkinson's sleep disease uh, we, we can also use uh, patient's diary. Uh, after that, we have um, neuropsychologists uh, and psychiatrists uh, who helps us with uh, the cognitive assessments where uh, the mini mental test is crucial. Uh, points uh, below 24 are actually a cutoff for the patient. And uh, here are listed the other uh, cognitive assessments which are regularly done in uh, our department and the neuropsychiatric tests uh, for uh, depression, anxiety, and uh, of course, uh, suicide uh, intentions. Those patients should not have uh, such, of course, and quality of life assessments in order to uh, follow up these patients and uh, check what's happening with their quality of life. So regarding the uh, initial results, uh, all 23 patients were referred to our GBS uh, center uh, after initial screening, uh, 23 left, and uh, out of them, 14 were um, good candidates, and in six of them, actually, we have uh, GBS on, and uh, our statistic is uh, based on these six patients with uh, bilateral STN uh, GBS system which are uh, with in mean age of uh, 61 uh, years, uh, five males and uh, one female patient. And you can see the duration of the Parkinson's disease and the duration from the first uh, symptoms. The most important thing is uh, the improvement of uh, the motor PGRS. This is the third part uh, in off period and uh, in on period before the surgery only on medication and uh, we found an improvement of uh, about 50 percent which is a very nice improvement uh, and indication for good um, results after the surgery actually uh, we compared the motor PGRS before the surgery and after the surgery and uh, we found very uh, good uh, difference uh, with um, statistical significance of improvement, whereas uh, there were generally no uh, difference in the uh, best medical uh, treatment on stage before and after the DBS. And of course, there is um, a rule that uh, uh, DBS can achieve the best uh, level dopa results regarding uh, without the uh, uh, resistant uh, tremor. Uh, another interesting uh, result is uh, the, um, the results about uh, the daily level DOPA uh, intake, which was uh, significantly uh, reduced. And uh, most patients were taking two or three uh, anti-Parkinsonian drugs. And after the um, surgery, uh, they were also reduced of course uh, we had some uh, side effects uh, there were no early surgical side effects uh, one uh, patient was with postoperative uh, delirium and one patient uh, had uh, mild postoperative chest uh, pain and uh, discomfort and we had no stimulation side effects so now i would like to uh, present a couple of uh, patients so the first uh, is a male of um, 50, 59 years of age, who actually was uh, with uh, drug intolerance, and that was the major indication for uh, his DBS uh, procedure. And uh, here is uh, the patient. Uh, he has uh, uh, static tremor, mainly on uh, his left side. Of course, bradykinesia. which was uh, bilateral, more, uh, more severe for the right side. When doing um, alternating movements, uh, the pattern was uh, different. And of course, you can see again the uh, changes 
in the speech in the bradykinesia during the the posture of the patient is typical and here is his uh, gait with short steps and uh, missing normal alternating uh, movements and here is uh, this, the same patient after the operation without any tremor on the left side with uh, really improved bradykinesia which was bilaterally improvement in the rapid alternating movements the gait uh, the position of the patient is also improved and his gait is much better and actually this patient uh, is still actively working without uh, any complaints in his uh, free time the other patient is a 40 uh, 55 uh, 54 years uh, female which was uh, who was on um, optimal level of dosages and uh, mainly rigidly bradykinetic form of parkinson's disease uh, this is uh, very hard to be uh, seen in these videos because rigidity is mainly felt during the uh, investigation bradykinesia but when we go to the gate you can see the differences and uh, the difficulties in turning and even she uh, has at least 40 to 50 uh, seconds to turn around and after that the gate goes with uh, really short steps here's the same patient after the surgery with uh, improved rigidity and here is the gait of the patient who is uh, turning around with ease after the procedure and here is the last patient I want to uh, present uh, he is actually a 60 years age uh, patient who was again on triple combination uh, with uh, optimal left doppler uh, dosage uh, the only uh, problem with this patient was uh, that the psychiatric status was actually normal at uh, the time of uh, the test but after the surgical procedure actually we had an amnestic data for um, hallucinations in the past and mild cerebral atrophy and here is this patient with uh, static tremor more intense in the uh, right side severe postural tremor bradykinesia more intense for the right limbs also for the legs when investigating the uh, lack agility he is not even able to make all the tests properly in his case we had uh, postural instability he was not able to maintain the um, posture on his own and here is uh, his gait with uh, short steps and uh, intensifying the uh, the tremor after the operation actually this patient has no uh, tremor in rest also much improved uh, postural tremor and the movements are much smoother without uh, that this severe body uh, kinesia bilaterally but yet the postural instability was present in his case as you know there is no 
improvement of uh, this uh, symptom, so he is not able to maintain it. But the case is very much improved, making uh, larger steps and much quicker uh, turning around. So, in conclusion, uh, bilateral STN DBS, uh, which had all other uh, all our patients, is an effective uh, effective uh, symptomatic therapy in Parkinson's disease in well selected patients. So, it is uh, very important for a proper uh, DBS candidate screening, and it is a complex process uh, that is accomplished by a multidisciplinary team and. This is the most important step toward the optimal results in uh, DBS. So the implementation of uh, comprehensive candidate screening protocol is, might be time consuming, but could significantly increase the patient's uh, benefits of uh, the procedure and to uh, reduce the potential risks of uh, adverse effects. Thank you. Actually, we are working together with Dr. Salta, Professor Andola, and Professor Caprelian in our DBS center, DBS team. So the most important are the first steps. Uh, we are doing them together. Do you have any questions from the other colleagues? If you don't have any questions because we are short of time, I would like to invite Dr. Denis Lowe from the Federal Sector of Surgery of Russia to present uh, her lecture entitled Complications of DBS. Uh, just one second. So, first of all, I want Thank uh, Professor Yinchev for organization of the symposium and for inviting me to participate in it. So, uh, my presentation is about complications of DBS therapy and DBS surgery as well. Um, I would like firstly to remind uh, where Russia is. And so, my city is situated almost in the center of country. And I'm a neurosurgeon and I work in Federal Center of Neurosurgery in Novosibirsk. And our experience is not so, uh, so big. We have in total 181 patients with the implanted DBS systems. So 95 of them are males and 86 of them females. Mean age is 52. And additionally, we have uh, 49 IPG replacements. A uh, majority of them were done because of battery end of life. And uh, for these seven years, we have total percent of complications is nearly 30%. Uh, so DBS uh, has its specific complications, and I would like to uh, divide them in three main groups. Uh, first group, surgery-related complications. Uh, intracranial hemorrhages is the most serious and most dangerous complications, pneumocephalus. Pneumocephalus is not so dangerous, but it can interfere with your precision and accuracy. Um, and venous air embolism. Then second group, hardware-related complications, uh, which are fracture of lead or extensions, lead or IPG migration, infection and skin erosion. And the third group is um, related to stimulation. So uh, there are some different adverse effects of stimulation, uh, behavior changing, and psychiatric symptoms. So uh, for, uh, let's start with first group, uh, early surgical complications. Here uh, in the table, uh, our statistics. So we have two patients with um, symptomatic hemorrhages and four patients with uh, no symptomatic hemorrhages. And we have three patients with venous air embolism during the surgery. And in all three cases, we had to uh, terminate our surgery. Uh, so about intracranial hemorrhages, here you can see the world statistics. Um, you can suspect uh, that there is hematoma or bleeding from the site of your uh, implantation. 
if you see some blood on your microelectrode uh, or on your cannula, um, if the patient has, uh, so he became conscienceless, or he has some neurological symptoms such as anisocaria, hemiparesis, or aphasia. Of course, if you do your DBS under local anesthesia, because under general anesthesia, you will see only probably anisocaria. And uh, if you do your microelectrode recording, you can see sudden bioelectrical silence. So uh, there will be no, no signal anymore. Uh, this is a CT scan of our patient. Uh, we got this huge hematoma. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't, of course, continue on DBS. And a uh, patient firstly complained that he has some uh, weakness in, in his arm. And then he became conscienceless. And then we saw this hematoma on CT scan. And unfortunately, this patient was discharged uh, from our hospital in vegetative state. So this was the most serious complication. Uh, I mean, in D after DBS surgery. Um, also, uh, some hematoma can, uh, can be revealed only after surgery. Uh, so it can be, uh, of course, neurological symptoms, headache, seizures, loss of consciousness, or no symptoms. So there are two scans, again, of our patients. This scan is, uh, is, uh, was done in a patient, uh, and we saw that our trajectory was done through ventricle, and that's why we got the blood in the ventricle, but fortunately, patient didn't have any neurological symptoms. Uh, he just had headaches. And this patient is quite interesting. Uh, this CT was done on the fourth day after surgery. Of course, we have done it right after surgery and on the second day, but only fourth day we could see blood. And on the second day after surgery, this patient had two generalized clonic seizures. And we couldn't actually understand why, uh, because uh, she didn't have any seizure anamnesis or something. And uh, on the fourth day, it, it became clear that there, there was some blood in the sulci. Uh, but the patient was okay, so she has never uh, uh, seizures more, and she doesn't take any anti-epileptic drugs. So if you see or if you suspect bleeding, uh, what to do? Uh, uh, so you, probably you should keep cannula inside, wash it with warm saline, and uh, if you uh, discover the blood on your microelectrode, uh, it's better to substitute it with electrode, like the lead from the system, because it will bring some pressure to small vessels, and you should leave it for 10 or 15 minutes. If there are no symptoms, you can go ahead with your surgery. If you see neurological symptoms, just stop your surgery and go to CT scan. And depending on what you see on CT scan, you should decide uh, uh, if it's necessary to evacuate hematoma or to put external ventricular drainage. How to avoid this uh, dangerous complication? So, of course, planning of electrode trajectory is very important. You should avoid sulci, avoid ventricles. Uh, some authors recommend to do MR or CT angiography, uh, which you can fuse with your T2 uh, MRI, for example. Well, it, it, it depends on what, uh, what uh, MRI you use. I mean, T1 or T2 for your planning. Uh, actually, we did earlier CT angiography and we've used it, but um, in this patient with huge hematoma, we also did fusion with angiography, but as you can see, it didn't help a lot. So now we don't see, we, we don't do angiography. So it's better, of course, minimize amount of electrode tracks. Uh, routinely, we use only two tracks, it's central and anterior and uh, avoid microelectrode recording. 
well, if it's possible, of course. Um, in our hospital, we tried to do uh, some patients without microelectrode recording and using OR intraoperative. So the results were comparable, and we seriously think about uh, changing our tactics probably. But uh, so far, our neurologists are, um, how to say it, uh, they're interested to participate in, in surgery. They want to see effect. They want to see uh, side effects and clinical effects. Uh, so they insist on uh, microelectrode recording. And of course, uh, it's important to uh, support normal arterial blood pressure during surgery and in the early period after. And when you select your patient, uh, you should think about uh, tablets which he takes, for example, anti uh, blood clot tablets or, or some coagulopathies. So you should reveal it before. Um, another complication uh, is pneumocephalus. So, as I already said, pneumocephalus can interfere uh, to your uh, precision and to your accuracy because. The air, which is located subdurally, um, it can move a CPC, and so it can lead to um, to wrong targeting. So, for example, in uh, during unilateral implantation, a CPC moves to contralateral side. During bilateral implantation, a CPC moves posteriorly, and after resolving this air, uh, electrode can go upwards till three millimeters. So it's a big amount, uh, which can, uh, which can, uh, I mean, can give some additional problems. So uh, at the beginning of our work uh, with DBS patients, we used this semi-seating position. We thought that it's more comfortable for patient and that it's a minimal CSF leakage uh, during uh, this head and body position. But uh, if you compare pros and cons of these two positions, you will see that prone position is more preferable. So in prone position, brain position is the same as on your MRI scan. You will get less pneumocephalus and you will get lower risk of venous air embolism. But it can cause a bigger loss of CSF and can uh, lead to higher risk of bleeding because the venous pressure in the brain is higher. In semi-seating position, there is no almost loss of CSF, better venous blood, blood outflow, but bigger pneumocephalus because of pressure gradients and higher risk of venous air embolism. There are two CT scans of patients with a similar age and with similar duration of the surgery. And you can see that in prone, in prone position, uh, the amount of air is much less than in semi-seating position. So uh, how to avoid uh, this air collection under dura matter. So it's better to prefer prone position and use some dural sealants. Uh, we use it right after implanting cannula and uh, then we close the, uh, our birth hole with heavy cell and sometimes surgery cell um, to try to uh, minimize your dural opening, minimize aspiration of CSF, and of course, decrease time of surgery. <clears throat> so there is another uh, very dangerous complication is venous air embolism. Uh, as you can see that percentage uh, in DBS and other stereotactic surgery is quite high. It, it goes to 4.5%. So we couldn't even think uh, that this small incision and small birth hole can lead to venous air embolism. But we have three cases in uh, during surgery. Uh, all three cases were uh, under local anesthesia, so patients were in consciousness. And uh, 
They complained on shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, decrease of oxygen. No, well, we saw a decrease of oxygen saturation. Uh, patient became, uh, patients became agitated. And finally, one of them uh, lost her consciousness. And uh, how to avoid and how to, uh, to guess what's going on. So it's better to use uh, some cannula, kisle, uh, oxygen cannula, uh, where your anesthesiologist can see a decreasing levels of entitled title carbon dioxide. And gold standard is transesophageal echocardiography of diagnostic, but uh, only in one patient, our anesthesiologist could see uh, some air bubbles in the heart uh, doing ultrasonography. In all three cases, we had to terminate our surgery and uh, 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 to bring patients to the uh, intensive care unit. What to do to prevent this complication? Of course, optimal body and head position. So head should be flexed <clears throat> no more than uh, 49, uh, sorry, 45 degrees closure of all bleeding points. So you should be really careful. Uh, you should use bone box and calculate all uh, visible vessels. Uh, constant irrigation of the birth hole with saline. And if you see symptoms of venous air, em air embolism, check the wound and uh, again, stop all bleeding points. <clears throat> administer uh, high flow oxygen to the patient. And if symptoms are threatening, of course, stop your surgery and close the skin. Immediate place the patient in the left lateral decubitus and turn the limbic position. And if necessary, you should start cardiac resuscitation. So the second group is device related complications because as you know, during DBS surgery, we implant IPG, two leads and two lead extensions. <clears throat> so we have experience working with uh, Medtronic, Boston Scientific and St. Jude, and we didn't see any difference in infection complications between them. So we have um, six cases of device infection, and in all six cases, we had to remove whole systems <clears throat> One uh, patient with skin erosion above electrode. In two patients, we had uh, electrode fracture. And uh, three patients had some symptoms of IPG migration. And uh, all of them required some revision surgery. So if you suspect fracture of electrode, um, well, you suspect if you see that one side uh, of the patient uh, doesn't work well. I mean, the effect of DBS stopped immediately and you can do anything with it. Uh, you should take programmer and check impedance. And if you see high impedance on the whole lead, of course, you should replace, it, uh, replace lead or lead extension. If you see high impedance uh, only on some contacts, probably you should start with programming patient uh, from these contacts which are still working. And uh, of course, you can try to do X-ray and sometimes you can see a disconnection of the system or uh, some br um, broken lead, but very often you cannot see anything actually. So another complication is migration uh, of lead. So it's um, quite uncommon. In adult patients, we have not seen any of them, but in the children, um, it can uh, happen secondary to skull growth because lead migrates dorsally. And uh, in some patients with neck dystonia, it can also happen. Um, IPG migration or sagging, it can happen uh, often in women with considerable breast tissue. And it can cause pain in this uh, IPG pocket, skin redness and erosion above IPG. 
so for, for ourselves, we uh, we decided to put our IPG under aponeurosis of uh, pectoral muscle and uh, fixated very thoroughly uh, to this aponeurosis. So there are also some pictures of the patient with signs of infection of the system. And here you can see that we could evacuate some blood and pus from the IPG pocket. Of course, we couldn't save the system, we couldn't rescue it. <clears throat> here is another case uh, where we saw skin erosion above the electrode. So in this particular patient, we still try to keep IPG, so we removed electrodes and we removed extensions and moved uh, IPG to another site. And I think there are already four months after surgery and um, she doesn't have signs of infection. Well, let's wait. And here's a, a picture of uh, skin erosion above IPG. And infection became, becomes really dangerous if it goes to the brain. There is also a MRI scan of our patient. Um, so we saw such picture of edema around the electrode. And of course, we had to remove the whole system and start antibiotic therapy. So what to do to prevent these complications? Uh, of course, surgeon and the patient wants to keep system or at least its component um, as long as it's possible. Uh, so you should uh, uh, do your surgery in aseptic uh, conditions uh, to use intraoperative antibiotics, a shorter surgical time, shaving hair, where about hair is controversial uh, question because some hospitals don't shave hair, some do. Uh, we, decided, we decided for ourselves that we shave full hair, but uh, as I know, there is no any proof of uh, worsening of infections uh, if you do uh, if you do DBS uh, on the patient we, we, which was not shaved. And, and uh, we decided to do in our hospital preventive antibacterial therapy during five or six days uh, or seven days after surgery. So we use cefriaxone usually. But unfortunately, we have already two cases of infection uh, in, in those patients we, who already got this preventive antibacterial therapy. So what to do uh, uh, to treat, to try to rescue this system? Uh, of course, if you see any, intra, any signs of intracranial inflammation, you should immediately remove all, uh, all the components of the system. In cases of superficial uh, wound infection, start antibiotics and try to heal the wound. In cases of deep infection, when uh, the implant is obviously infected, just remove the system or its component and start antibacterial therapy. <clears throat> if only some component of the system has been removed, uh, administer some prolonged antibacterial therapy and uh, monitor your patient. In our experience, in those patients where we can, we were trying to keep some components of the system, in two or three months, we removed uh, the rest of components because of infection. So, and the third and last group of complication is stimulation related complications. So, uh, there are some side effects of stimulation, dysarthria. We had, uh, we had it in two patients with beam stimulation. One patient uh, had some apraxia of eyelid opening. It was STNDBS patient. Four patients has hypomania or depression symptoms. And one of them actually, uh, there was one suicide in our, uh, um, among our patients. Hypersexuality in two patients, shopping addiction in two patients, funding in one patient. 
psychiatric symptoms uh, in 24 patients. So I mean that uh, we, we see these psychiatric symptoms in very early period after surgery. So <clears throat> it is psychosis, agitation, aggression, disorientation. Um, and we could see that uh, more often we see these psychiatric symptoms which are reversible and which are seen in early period uh, only in patients with Parkinson's disease uh, with the target STN. And it usually starts on the second or third day after surgery and symptoms are psycho psychosis, agitation, aggression, disorientation. So uh, to prevent, we administer two milligrams of clonazepam in the evening right after surgery. And if it doesn't work, we invite our psychiatrist and uh, he already administers some clozapine if it's necessary. Uh, behavior changing. Behavior changing is not uh, always recognizable. Sometimes relatives can come to you and say that my husband became another person or my wife or uh, that, uh, that he started, for example, doing some things unusual for him or some experienced neurologist can see it. Um, it usually happens during stimulation of most ventral contact due to spreading to the substantia nigra retiviata or stimulation of the limbic STN territory. So what to do? Try to use different settings. Uh, it's now easy to do with directional leads, but we don't have it. So we just try to change active contact. And if it doesn't work, we try uh, to use bipolar stimulation. If it's necessary, decrease voltage. And um, so you can also do some um, correction of your medical treatment. For example, in addicted patients, you should reduce dopaminergic medication. And in depressive patients or with some suicide intentions, probably you should resume L-DOPA and uh, decrease stimulation parameters. And uh, I have some conclusions. So DBS is safe and effective treatment for several neurological disorders, which has its own specific complications. And to reduce rate of complications, of course, it's important to collect surgical experience and probably to uh, collect it in one center. Uh, uh, introduction of new surgical equipment and technology. So here I mean that now there are so many options. Uh, for example, uh, production of smaller IPG or directional leads, which can help to avoid some adverse effect of stimulation. Uh, of course, appropriate patient selection, as it was already mentioned before and zero pre-operative planning and post-operative management. So well, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, please ask. Oh, it was very interesting and very useful presentation, uh, especially for us like beginners in the field. Unfortunately, we, we don't have time for questions. Otherwise, I would ask you, what was the treatment of your complication shopping addiction because we can use this way of treatment in our daily practice or with our relatives and try to joke a little bit. Oh, you, are, you are very tired already and now it's time for our coffee coffee break. But any uh, virtual coffee break, if you have, if you have any questions from the, the other faculties, please. Professor Kjellan? Well, thanks for this. Um... It's a very, very honest presentation, and I think it's very important that we, that we present our complications, and we surely have complications ourselves. I wanted to uh, to comment on what you said in one of the slides. The prone position of placement is increasing the hemorrhage risk. This is certainly not my experience. I have uh, I have done in the prone position, uh, uh, left alone DPS, around 350 cases in the in the past six to seven years. 
And if you do them all in the prone position, that has to do with the setup that we use in the OR. And that makes a lot of things better. We have never seen pneumocephalus. We don't see lead migrations. Um, we have never seen air embolism in none of our patients. So I think it's a, it's a good thing to convince the neurologist who works with you because it's a pure access to the patient problem to convince him to say, hey, it's much safer for the patient if he's lying prone. That's my, my comment on that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. If there are any other comments, I suggest you to start the, with the virtual coffee break. We need to keep the program, so please, I, I know that you are very tired, but after nine minutes, we, we should start, we, we should go further with the next lecture. Thank you, thank you. At 11 o'clock, we will go. Thank you.
we are still waiting for the other faculties to switch on their videos and audios. Uh, okay, uh, I don't want to be late with the program. I suppose that you are tired. It's a Saturday night. It's a Saturday, so it's a day for for uh, rest. I will start with the next presentation. The next presentation is entitled Deep Brain Stimulation for Parkinson's Disease Initial New Experience in Varna, Bulgaria. Uh, can you see now the screen? Is there a, is a presentation on it? The screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, basically, this lecture will be focused to the neurosurgical aspects of our initial neurosurgical experience in Varna. Uh, in 2019, the Bulgarian healthcare system accepted full coverage of the deep brain stimulation treatment for patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and dystonia. This was the main reason to start the DBS treatment for Parkinson's disease in our clinic because previously the cost of this treatment was unattainable for the patients. Uh, the post-operative outcome is well known that it's depending on the patient selection, the target focalization, and the performance of the procedure. Uh, the most important predictor of the good post-operative outcome is the patient's response to level doctor therapy. By definition, more than 30% improvement in the motor section of the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale as compared to the off period. For patients with established diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, the minimum duration of the symptoms is four to five years. Uh, motor symptoms are severe enough to cause significant disability. Uh, very important is to, to, that, to mention that the cognitive decline and dementia are the contraindications for the DBS procedure. Uh, important is to evaluate the other comorbidities like diabetes, hypothyroidism, and hypertension, and to, to evaluate the risk of developing a postoperative intracranial hemorrhage, which in hypertensive Parkinson's patients is increased 2.5 times in comparison to normal tensive patients. The preoperative counseling must focus on the away condition of the patient during the DBS procedure and the necessity of patient's cooperation during surgery. Patients and their relatives must understand that DBS procedure, it's not a definitive cure. It serves mainly as a disease modifier, which invariably requires adjustment of the electrical parameters on a regular basis. Uh, DBS uh, treatment is a teamwork. In our team, the neurologists were responsible for the diagnosis, the patient selection, the intraoperative neuromonitoring and neurological testing, the postoperative follow-up and the DBS parameters adjustment. Uh, we, like neurosurgeons, participated in the patient selection, uh, were responsible for the DBS procedure and the postoperative wounds follow up, the anesthetists for the, the anesthetists for the wake DBS procedure, and the neuroradiologists for the pre and postoperative CT and MRI studies. From October 2019 to April 2020, bilateral STN stimulation was performed on six patients, five male and one female. In our clinic, the procedure was performed following all the technical guidelines. Uh, step by step, the, these are the preoperative non stereotactic MRI, stereotactic frame fixation, stereotactic CT scan plank, the lead implantation, the implantable pulse generator uh, placement, and the programming. The MRI general conditions it should be contiguous, non overlapping slices, no gap, no overlap, slice thickness of 1.0, constant slice thickness, and no oblique slices. St. Marina preoperative MRI protocol uh, was mentioned already in the presentation of Dr. Salta. However, uh, it's 1.5 Tesla T1 actual sequence C1 to top of the head 1 mm sections with gadolinium contrast matter for optimal visualization of all blood vessels. And 3 Tesla SWI actual sequence 1.6 mm slice for optimal visualization of the deep nuclei. After acquisition, all images are transferred to the planning system in DICOM format. 
The stereotactic frame fixation is important to uh, transfer, uh, to deduce the coordinates, which in turn are used during surgery to reach any target inside the cranium. Use the lexical stereotactic system. We prefer to use Velcro pads instead of the ear plugs in order to reduce the possibility of vasovagal syncope. We prefer also to clip all the hair of the patient. The frame fixation is done while the patient is sitting comfortably on a chair. Uh, the two anterior posts are fixed over the forehead. They are longer compared to the two posterior occipital posts. The scalp is infiltrated with a local anesthetic agent. We prefer to use 50 to 50 combination of pivotine and lidocaine. Uh, then we start with um, uh, the, uh, the frame is centered along the skull. Should the frame base should not be positioned above the level of the external acoustic canal. While placing the stereotactic frame on the patient's head, the frame base should be kept aligned with along the orbital metal plane, which will keep the frame base parallel to the ACTC line. During the procedure, the length required for the screw's insertion can also be measured. Screws are tightened diagonally to reduce the shifting of the axis. After the frame fixation, the patient is transferred to the diagnostic unit for a stereotactic CT scan. The, pa the patient is positioned prone on the CT couch and the stereotactic frame is positioned on the frame adapter, which is fixed on the CT table. The next step is the placement of the fiducial indicator box on the stereotactic frame and the markings on the coordinator box are aligned aligned along the city gantry laser lights, which can pre prevent any tilt of the city gantry. Uh, the city scan is acquired with a slice thickness of 1 mm, contiguous, with no overlap. The acquired images are also transferred to the planning system in DICOM format. The planning is done on the planning station after both of the images of the MRI and the stereotactic CT scan are imported. Uh, we used uh, the, met, the uh, image guided navigation of Medtronic Stealth Station S7 for the planning phase of the procedure. Uh, the stereotactic CT images and the MRI images are fused. Uh, then the planning includes the definition of, of the intracranial targets, STN, the entry points of the skull, and the trajectory through the brain. Injuring of the eloquent cortex, the salty, the ventricles, and the blood vessels must be avoided. It's well known. We prefer to use direct targeting, where by directly visualizing, locating, and marking the targeted nucleus. It's also possible to use indirect targeting by using internal reference landmarks like anterior posterior commission, other midline structures, and in the inbuilt Schaltenbrand Warren Atlas. In modern imaging modalities, direct targeting is always possible and it's considered more accurate. For targeting ST8, we use the sections of the MRI where we found the maximum bulk of the red nucleus. Two tangents are drawn on the anterior and lateral border of the red nucleus. The STN is located 3 mm lateral to the point where these tangents intersect. All six of the patients operated on in our center were performed by lateral STN stimulation. The workstation provides the details of the target as the coordinates labeled it as X, Y, and Z. Also, the entry point, point coordinates as arc and ring values on the stereotactic arc. Uh, then the patient positioning in the operating theater. Uh, there is an adapter fixed onto the Mayfield base that is attached to the operating table. The head, the head is elevated 30 to 40 degrees. The lead placement is usually done under the local anesthesia. Uh, the head of the patient on the stereotactic frame are cleaned with 10% polydon iodine. The draping is done in a manner that permits access to the patient's face and limbs for clinical examination. The X, Y, Z coordinates values are set on the stereotactic frame. The stereotactic arc is fixed on the head frame, and all settings must be checked at least by two of the team members in the operating theater. Then the arc and the ring values are set to locate the right entry point. After infiltration, we perform the skin incision under craniotomy. Uh, with a uh, diameter of 14 millimeters. Uh, over the burr hole, we are fixing the Medtronic steam lock ring uh, used for securing the DBS lead at the end of the implantation. Uh, then we go further with the durotomy and corticotomy. The underlying cortex is also coagulated and, and a small corticotomy is performed. Uh, we are uh, fixing the, the ring with the arc. 
Then the microdag with its mounted electrodes are moved into the brain. We prefer to use three from five electrodes, central, medial, and posterior in most of the cases, but sometimes they were different. This is the, the connection with the microelectrodes with the mirror system. Then the dural defect can be sealed with a fibrin glue to prevent the brain shift from the CSF leakage. The electrodes mounted on the 0.1 millimeter scale micro drive are gradually moved forward the target. The neurophysiological technique of microelectrode recording is continuously done to look, to look for the target. The 40 mm mark on the micro drive signifies the target level. Once the target is localized precisely with the help of microelectrode recordings, each electrode is stimulated to look for the best motor response in the form of rigidity, reduction, ease of performing motor activity, and clarity of speech. During the stimulation of the patient is awake and interacting with the clinical neurologist who is performing the tests. Any side effects in the form of dystonia, hemiparesis, Visual symptoms of dyskinesia are also noted. This is the neuro, the mare and the, the, the stimulation process. The neurological test, testing intraoperatively uh, done by Dr. Salta or the other neurologist. The microelectrode recordings for the central lead. This approach permits the neurophysiological mapping of the targeted SDN being enhanced by functional mapping to better localize the microelectrode placement within the targeted SDN. Uh, a CRM, uh, we were told to, the, to this technique by uh, Professor Balash, a CRM image intensifies position in such a way that the X ray image shows the two rings of the stereotactic arc overlapping with one another and appearing as two concentric rings. The electrode with optimal localization is then marked on an X-ray screen and taken out. The other electrodes act as anchor, preventing the brain shift as a reference. Then a quadripolar lead is inserted into the target position. The DBS lead is taken up to the level marked on the X-ray reference to the other electrode. You can see the, the, the mark on the screen, X-ray screen. Once the quadripolar DBS lead is at its destination, all the recording electrodes are taken out. Then the, the DBS lead is firmly secured by the Medtronic steam lock system. The introducing of the steam lock, locking the system. A similar procedure is performed on the left side. The connection ends of both leads are brought to the left side, operative incision, through the subglial space and kept into the subglial pouch on the left side. The right sided scalp incision is permanently closed in two layers. And the left-sided scalp incision is temporarily closed with the interrupted sutures. The stereotactic frame is removed. The patient is put under general anesthesia for the implantable pulse generator placement. The patient is positioned supine with the head turned on the right side. A transverse incision about 7 cm is made 4 cm below the clavicle in the left subclavian region. A pouch in the plane above the pectoral fascia is created with a flap thickness 1.5 to 3 centimeters. If not enough, subcutaneous tissue is present, then subfacial, submuscular, submuscular plane can be utilized. Uh, the thinner flap can lead to erosion of the skin over the implant. The thicker flap, however, can lead to problems during the remote charging and programming of the IPG. The left bird hole is uh, reopened. The DBS leads are taken out of the subglial pouch, pouch. A subcutaneous tunnel is made from the birth hole side to the chest incision. Then the tunnel passes behind the ipsilateral ear. Two different lengths of extensions wires are passed through the tunnel. The longer for the right side uh, one and the shorter for the left sided one. Extension wires. These extension wires attach to their respective DBS leads. The DBS leads and the extension wires contacts are covered with a specially designed silicone sheets and tied against with the sutures. They are fixed, tied with sutures. 
the strain free loops of the lead into the subgluteal pouch and the subcutaneous pouch in the chest are created to allow for movement of the head and neck. After connecting of the DBS leads to the extension wires at the cranial end, the inferior end of the extension wires are connected to the IPG battery. The IPG is switched on and the impedance of each side is checked. It should be, it should be within the range of 500 to 4000 ohms. The IPG is switched off, inserted into the infraclavicular subcutaneous pouch and fixed to the pectoral fascia with sutures. The wound uh, the wounds are closed in layers, then sterile dressing is applied. The patient is extubated and shifted to the ward for observation. Once the patient is stable, a CT scan is performed and merged with the MRI images to check for complications including inaccuracy of the electrode placement. This is the post-operative CT scan of the patient. You can see uh, the, the, the accuracy of the implanted electrodes and the pre-planned pre trajectories for the targets. The programming in our center is done after one month following surgery to allow the, for subsidence of the microelectrode lesioning effect of the electrodes at the target sites. The DVS programming is complex and usually needs several follow-up sessions before the final stimulation parameters are identified. The post-operative programming and follow-up in our center is performed by the team of clinical neurologists working together with the surgical team. From October 2019 to April 2020, as I already mentioned, we operated six patients. They underwent bilateral STN stimulation. Five male patients underwent um, uh, STN DBS stimulation with no rechargeable LPG. One female patient underwent uh, bilateral STN DBS with rechargeable IPG. Fortunately, uh, we didn't have any surgical complications early or delayed. Um, during the follow-up of these patients up to date. In conclusion, DBS is technically challenging, challenging procedure requiring diligent approach to target localization as well as precise and careful operative execution for optimal surgical outcome. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Balash and Professor College for being our uh, Proctors, our mentors, our teacher, to be together with us during our first steps in the neurosurgical uh, DBS treatment of our patients. So thank you for your attention. Any questions or most probably any advices because we are just in the beginning of the process of establishing our DBS center. We are trying to do our best and we are hoping that we'll improve our results with the future with the more patients treated. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Yeah, actually, I would like to comment and congratulate you on the establishment of this program. I mean, you do you do not seem to uh, to be so unexperienced as you say. So I'd like to congratulate you and your team of of what you do. Know that's really really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, are there any any comments, any questions? Can we start then with the next presentation? It's going to be the deep brain stimulation uh, and the <coughs> neural circuitry of depression by Professor Kionen. Well, thank you. I'll try to um, to free this up again. So, I hope you can see that presentation. Um, so, this is our uh, this is our discussion about the um, about the security of depression. And since we have no other lecture on depression um, in here. Uh, I have to be a little bit introductory on that. Now, um, depression is a common mental disorder. Uh, globally, more than uh, than uh, 300 million people of all ages suffer from depression. It's the leading cause of disability worldwide. 
depression can lead to suicide, suicidal ideation, and then um, uh, those patients kill themselves. And it's around, it depends a little bit on the year. Uh, it, it says sometimes 1 million, sometimes 800,000, but a huge amount of patients kill themselves. There are effective treatments for depression, which are typically uh, drug treatment and psychotherapy, especially in Germany, it's a lot of psychotherapy, and then advanced methods like electroconvulsive therapy or uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, repetitive uh, ones. But despite all these efforts, more than 20% are uh, Tom Schlepfer, who I'm working with, the psychiatrist, biological psychiatrist, says it's, uh, it's about 30%. Um, who uh, remain, remain treatment refractory. And for a subtraction of those, uh, deep brain stimulation might be an option for treatment. Uh, we are talking about um, from the DSM-5, and that's the latest and sixth edition, already again, six years old, uh, about major depressive disorder, single or recurrent episodes. And I make you aware that there's a lot of other reasons for depression. That's why I'm saying 20% uh, of those uh, depressions are probably apt to being treated in basically. Now, uh, the, the uh, stereotactic treatment uh, of depression, that's nothing that we invented. I mean, uh, stereotactic neurosurgeon, like I, I said in my previous talk, and probably the one or the other of you have heard that, uh, actually, the reason why stereotactic neurosurgery was developed is actually um, the aftermath of psychosurgery. And in the, um, in the um, evolution, uh, since the um, uh, the late 40s of the last centuries, there have been a couple of uh, a couple of um, stereotactic lesion surgeries and part open lesion surgery, but then later stereotactic lesion, lesion surgery. And I make you aware of capsulotomy, cingulotomy, subcordate tractotomy, and if you combine cingulotomy and subcordate tractotomy, that's called limbic lichotomy. And from that evolution. Uh, um, actually, there's, an, there's a period, and I'm not going too much into that, uh, in the Tulane University in the 50s and 60s of the past century, Tulane University in the USA, Mississippi, uh, where Robert Heath does deep brain stimulation for a variety of psychiatric indications. Actually, very interesting story, but has not had a lot of impact on the development. With the development of, um, of um, uh, deep brain stimulation, first for pain, then for movement disorders in a broader fashion. In the late 80s with Louis, uh, Adam Louis Benavid, we get, we see a renaissance of psychiatric stimulation as well. That's starting again uh, with the OCD stimulation led by, um, by um, Bart Nuttmann at that moment in the Karolinska incident. You see the stimulation targets that have been developed for DBS, for OCD and uh, and um, uh, and uh, depression. CG25 by um, by Andres Lozano and Helen Mayberg. VCVS and nucleus accumbens. Um, uh, bad nucleus sphere terminalis. That's typically used for OCD. Then uh, the target that we prefer to uh, call the SLMFB, and then also, also a small series of lateral uh, habenula. Now we've done we have done ten years ago an evaluation of all those um, uh, stimulation regions, and besides uh, SCG, so the CG25 target, uh, we think that we are all in the same security. At that moment in time, we had to say. Probably CG25 does not belong to the same security now, and you will see that in the later course of this lecture, uh, you will see that probably CG25 actually is again part of the same security. We think all these stimulations, as you can see in the slide, um, happen uh, in the reward security, and actually the reason for this talk is to show that uh, that either all of them are somehow efficacious, and the media forward model is, appears to be in small series to be efficacious as well. And I'll try to, to guide you through why we think that should be done. Now, where are we? We have two uh, stopped pivotal multicentric trials for DBS and depression. So uh, depression is not a therapy today, be, be, um, beside or, or despite multiple efforts of, of groups around the world. And I'm sure just showing what's typically happening in those multicentric trials, you see on the left side uh, the depression severity over time in uh, in a treatment trial. That's the CG25 uh, trial. Uh, 90 patients included at that moment in time, 60 active, 30 to sham, six months active or sham, and then six months open, then futility analysis. So at this moment in time, where you have the stimulate uh, the the blue thing here, you see now the whole group is uh, stimulated. And there is a certain slope, and the uh, mean score of depressivity improves. 
But in order to produce an outcome, you would have had to be there. And the next thing you see is that despite introduction of simulation in the whole group now, that that uh, line doesn't change. So, and as Keith Matthews once said two years ago on the ESSFN trial, he said, um, well, you wouldn't have uh, had to have a deep brain stimulation in order to get uh, to get a, a line like this. They uh, concluded and said it's, it confirmed the safety and feasibility of subcolosal singular DBS as treatment um, for treatment resistant depression. And uh, further studies are needed to investigate factors such as clinical failure features or electrode placement. And that actually then led um, for them to use uh, diffusion tender imaging also to target, to better target uh, their CG25. Now, this is a timeline that I'd like to show. And this is just to, to show the experience that we have with this SLMFB, with the superior lidar media forward bundle uh, to treat depression. There's actually one other group that I'd like to acknowledge besides us. There's, uh, there's, uh, some, um, there's some um, uh, single uh, cases that have been published around the world. Um, we have had uh, the group by uh, Al Finoy in Houston. He's not at Baylor College. Um, and um, he has also very, very good results. He's the, the only other person who's done constantly doing SLMFB. We've recently seen an SLMFB in two cases being, being presented in brain stimulation. And uh, the title was um, SLMFB DBS does not have antidepressant efficacy in uh, two patients and did fail in two patients. And I have to acknowledge if I'm thinking about it, uh, I had two patients of SDN, at least two patients of SDN failing uh, VIM failing, GPI failing. I'm not aware why a publication like that was necessary, but it was there. And we are doing uh, a large um, multicentric trial here um, in uh, Freiburg, Bonn. Actually, it's going to be uh, Amsterdam as well and um, and Grenoble, uh, where we implant 50 patient 50, uh, and we have already done uh, 22 of those since 2018. The rationale for the SLMFB, uh, and that might be a wrong name for something that's a projection out of the ventral tegmental area, is this report that we did in 2009. And uh, we saw that if you're stimulating uh, at the medial border of the SDN, you catch those fibers that contribute to the reward uh, security. So, and then the idea was if you have SDN DBS with a euthymic patient doing well, not having a depression, and you stimulate him and drive him into hypomania and mania, would that at the same moment mean that if you had a depressed patient with a, with a malfunction in the region of the ventral tegmental area as the V-shaped region down here, would they benefit from doing that? And we actually did that. And that's the long-term follow-up of a first series of eight patients published in 2017. And you see, if you start to stimulate, you get a dramatic response in SLMFB stimulation, get an antidepressant effect. And that's that's surely surely at the response level here, and you see that's up to um, 50, 49 to 50 months of stimulation, right? So we're talking about four years follow up, which actually works. Now the reason to describe the media forum bundle was as as I showed before. Um, uh, we uh, are pretty sure that we are dealing with a corticopetal, so starting in the VTA, going to the cortex, the corticopetal uh, pathway that you see uh, lighting up after you did a bilateral um, capsulotomy. And I tried to show you this, I put this in this slide, this is not a patient um, uh, MRI, that's an ex vivo brainstem that we have scanned at 7 Tesla for more than 15 hours in order to show uh, show the fine anatomy. And you just to show you the topography, so that's the red nucleus, subthalamic nucleus is sitting here. Then you would uh, see here the fibers that uh, come in and go out of the subthalamic nucleus. That's ansel anticularis going to the GPI here. And the SLMFB is actually starting where the tributaries from the SDN, those fibers in the in the tract here, those so the mesocortical fibers and the mesolimbic fibers conjoin in the VTA and then follow up to the frontal lobe. And that's actually already the reason or the region where we are stimulating. Anatomically, the medial forebrain bundle subserves a lot of regions um, in uh, the frontal uh, cortex. Uh, they are reward, uh, a related reward associated uh, regions, typically orbitofrontal. And for the ones who are interested in uh, Brotman anatomy, that checks out to being uh, Brotman's area 8, 9, 11, 11M, and a little bit of 47. And they are all known 
uh, to be very closely related to reward and reward related learning. And if you see here, you see that's that's typically like the frontal pole, the tip of the frontal pole, and then and then basically um, under under the orbitofrontal cortex. That's typically what makes evolutionary uh, the human primate the human primate. So that's what it is. So here again, the target region. You see, we are in the triangle here between the mammalothalamic tract, the rect nucleus, and the SDN, the stimulation region again here, and then just showing we have the mesocortical and mesolimbic, and then that whole region going to either uh, the ventral striatum and nucleus accumbens here, where it, where it passes by and has fibers going to it, and then to the um, frontal cortex. The stimulation that we are doing um, uh, looks like this. So we intercalate those electrodes, typically seven and a half millimeter electrode, be it a three three eight nine metronic electrode, or now we do um, we do um, uh, directional electrodes uh, because the trial that we're doing at this moment is um, is supported by uh, Boston Scientific. We do microelectrode recording. We look at heart rate increase. That's an autonomous signal of showing that you are in the right structure. We typically see an acute anti, um, uh, we, we see an acute um, arousal effect. We see that patients start to interact, appetitive motivation. We look at the deepest point of the implantation. We look for the Ipsilateral cranial nerve three, so ocular motor activation, which you want to have at the deepest point of the implantation. We always do uh, atlas registration then, and then typically you have a stimulation that would, uh, in the end, uh, look a little bit like this in a, in this artistic condition. Now there's other people who say, uh, um, and I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that because it's an ongoing uh, discussion. Um, that's um, um, uh, is especially coming out of the Haber group uh, here together with Peterson and uh, Cameron McIntyre, but others as well, they debate if the SLMFP as such does exist. Uh, I'm quite sure it does exist. They're saying these are all false positives going down here. That is actually all going to um, uh, to the medial SDN. I'm not quite sure if this is true. They based this on macaque studies. You see that here, that's cortical injection and then enterograde transport that should only go to the SDN. But if you look, there's a lot of transportation going outside the SDN into the ventral tegmental area and no mention of the VTA. And interestingly enough, uh, four years after we have mentioned the medial fulvar bundle or the SLMFB as such structure, they named it uh, the limbic hyperdiac pathway. Then it was named the um, anterior medial STN. We saw it's called the tracked target. So people obviously have problem with the uh, term SLMFB, which we today also call the VTA prefrontal projection um, uh, pathway. Now, uh, I said that probably CG25 also has to do a little bit with the SLMFB. And if you look into, uh, into um, uh, the CG25 circuitry, which we show in red here, and you look at the SLMFB circuitry, then you see that they come pretty close together and actually meet in a region that we have uh, found to be uh, volume uh, changed uh, with, with a clear, um, with a clear, call, um, um, uh, with a clear correlation to stimulation efficacy if that volume change is there also. But this is not about the volume change. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but all the candidate structure that uh, that Riva Posse and um, and Helen Myberg from uh, from the uh, Emory group basically have said are also in that um, in that uh, structure here uh, incorporated. So we are very in the middle of the security optimization. Um, I like to look at the, and we did a recent publication this year about the uh, corticofugal and the corticopetal aspect of things. Typically, um, most of the fibers are coming down from the neocortex, but we are very sure that there's uh, fiber tracts that go up. And the problem with the corticofugal uh, thing is that the, that the um, or with the corticofugal view of things is that the, um, the, the regions that, that are in the cortex, they change their function depending on what the cortex does. So you cannot just attribute one function to a part in the cortex because there's a lot of plasticity going on. So if you st if you start to seed or do local injection down here, you will not see the entirety of the network, but you will only see how the network in part is connected to others. This is why we think you should follow a more evolutionary approach and look at the at the um, subcortical network hubs. And then basically do injection or your tracing from there and then look where everybody is connected to.
I'd like to make you aware that the, that the human brain, uh, the human brain itself, it has uh, developed a couple of times. So it's not something that has been there um, uh, all along. But especially if you're staying in the branch of where the human brain has has developed, you might be able to find that there's evolutionary steps that are still in uh, our brains uh, incorporated there. And that's actually the theory of Paul McLean, who wrote this very, very fine book, The Triune Brain and Evolution. And he basically says that there's a reptilian, paleomammalian, and a neomammalian brain, and that you can find parts of the evolutionary step uh, still in the, uh, in the human brain. And we've used that in order to translate into our a structure here, so that's the reptile, the paleo, and the neomammalian brain, and that that checks out to something like brainstem, basal ganglia, uh, ganglia thalamus, and then actually the prefrontal cortex or the neocortex, uh, in order to look at what reward and then other um, systems actually do. I'd like to acknowledge him. I've worked with uh, Jak Pangsep, who sadly died in 2017 and he had a basic emotion uh, for he was the one who basically uh, founded effective neuroscience he said that uh, all the basic emotions are already there in the lower species and also in the higher species and you can draw a lot of conclusions from there and i mind you to uh, this publication um, by Naomi Eisenberger uh, published already in 2003 that pretty nicely proves that Pangseps uh, stimulation results were very, very good. And this, what you see here, we will, uh, in the due course of this lecture, also see as the effect system. Now, uh, there's a couple of systems that have been associated with either reward and with, uh, sorry, with either depression and with OCD. You have the effect system, the reward system that I've been talking about, the default mode system, and the cognitive control system. And all those systems can also be found subcortically. But the psychiatrists don't talk about the subcortical parts of the emotional uh, systems. And we as stereotactic neurosurgeons know, I mean, our, our society, our, uh, our, the art of what we are doing has developed from the psychiatric indications. So we know we can have influence on emotional system by looking at the subcortical reasons. So the aims of, of, of the study that I'm briefly presenting here is um, we would like to describe in detail subcortical projection pathways from the brainstem, basal ganglia, and thalamus towards cerebral and cerebellar cortex, including the cortical convergences, with a special remark on the interior of the internal capsule. We would like to assign the established projection pathways to those cortical networks that I've just shown. And we would like to show the evolutionary network perspective and then simulate distinct, um, distinct. Um, uh, deep brain stimulation and stereotactic lesion surgery targets into that in order to get an idea about the networks that we're actually dealing with. We did that as a pure stimulation study from the human connectome project. So 200 uh, subjects included, warped them to the MNI brain. We did a global tracking of the whole brain, then selected nuclei in the depths, the ventral tegmental area, the subthalamic nucleus as, as the structure as such, substantia nigra, red nucleus, dorsal medial thalamus, and the ventral lateral thalamus. We, we constrained them by everything that's going through the anterior limb of the internal caption and had to end in the prefrontal cortex. And that is like a cortical petal as opposed to cortical fugal um, simulation or, or a simulation. Cortical terminals were simulated, and then we assigned that by literature analysis, analysis to uh, the network's effect reward cognitive control. And since we're only looking at projection pathways, we could not assign that to the um, uh, to uh, the default mode network, which is the connection between the frontal region and the parietal region. So we're not regarding that. That's uh, our um, seeding regions, just to briefly show what we were actually doing. And that's the results. Um, and that's already on the group level. And you can nicely see how, uh, if you're looking at the back of the, of the brain stem, a little bit from the side, you can see hyperdirect pathway. That's what we're typically stimulating, uh, what, what the part that's going to the motor cortex and a little bit prefrontal in our um, motor stimulation for Parkinson's disease. This is where those tributaries are um, um, located going into the SNMFP. That's the red nucleus. 
And you can see how nicely those things arrange when you look at them from the network perspective, from the subcortical hub, that the medial dolphin thalamus, uh, the superior lateral medial foreground bundle, red nucleus here, and then on the outside more the um, the um, um, from the SDN and the SNR coming. You see that the lower part going to the orbitofrontal cortex with the convergence on the orbitofrontal cortex. Um, you see uh, that you have um, uh, pr uh, um, projections from the mediodolphal thalamus and from the SLMFB, um, uh, which is obviously very important. If you look at uh, cortical uh, parts and cortical extensions of those networks, very interesting that the SLMFB has virtually the same projection patterns onto the frontal cortex, uh, like the uh, mediodolphal anterior thalamic radiation. So they seem to be at interplay and they seem to be very, very important to, to look at. We've then simulated based on those studies um, from, from eminent colleagues who did larger series on things we simulated into the MNI brain where stimulations would be, um, uh, it's basically replication of what we've did already 10 years ago, but with better technology. And what you see then is that most of the stimulations have to do something with the green structure here and with the orange structure here. So that is largely related to a stimulation um, of um, of structure number four, which is the ventral tegmental area projection pathway, or as we call it, the SLMFB. And you see that most of those targets actually have a, in the histogram and the attribution to fiber track simulation have a large peak in uh, structure number four. So we think that most of the things that we're doing today, especially uh, in depression and OCD, are actually related to stimulation uh, of the reward system and at the same time a modulation of the effect system, which we think is typically affected more by stereotactic lesion surgeries. That then checks out if you look at the anterior limb of the internal capsule, you can see all those pathways there. So the anterior limb of the internal capsule is not a single pathway that is a fiber, that it's a pass through. Those fibers go through there. If you want to stimulate in the inferior part, and you want to stimulate therefore OCD or depression, we think you should stay on the outside, more lateral in the anterior limb of the internal capsule. If you want to do a lesion, you probably want to be more on the medial side. Actually, this, these are results that on a small series always they have been replicated by the colleagues in Vancouver. Let me wrap up. Subcortical fiber pathways can be attributed to three cortical networks relevant for OCD and uh, as we talk about here, uh, the major depression. A corticopetal approach helps to understand phylogenetic development of networks and characterizes the entire network, including the cortical terminals. DBS and stereotactic lesion surgery in OCD and, uh, and major depression largely affect the effect and the reward system. And side effects and lesions to the anterior limb of the internal capsule are likely related to the cortico, uh, to, to the cortical control network uh, location in dorsal part. So if you do a lesion in the anterior limb of the internal capsule that reaches very high up, you have a high chance to to reach the the um, um, the uh, projections from and to uh, the SDN and other um, uh, cortical control related networks parts are very likely that's related. Um, the projection from the ventral tegmental area are undercharacterized in the current anatomy. Limitations, this is a search for network as patterns. It only uses normative data and no patients are included. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kionan. It was really a very interesting presentation. I'm sure that your scientific, basic scientific studies will uh, for sure improve the quality of life in the future of the patients. I'm sure that it's a really you know, cont a real contribution for the scientific society. Uh, Thank you. Uh, any any, any, can, uh, any questions? Any comments? We are not experienced. We are very far from this. From my other colleagues. Can I ask? Uh, so I have a question concerning psychosurgery in in Germany. Uh, do you uh, operate these patients with major depression and OCD in routine life or in the frames of uh, research project? And another small question, uh, what other psychiatric pathology you are allowed to operate in Germany? So that's the, uh, thank you for this, uh, Dr. Denisova. So the, 
Um, so um, uh, psychiatric surgery is allowed in uh, in Germany. We are actually it, it's not forbidden, but it's not the the psychiatrists don't like if we do lesions. So we're not doing lesions at this moment in time. Although I think there is a room for lesions, as I just ex have explained. Um, we have a, a European um, a European allowance to do. Uh, to do OCD DBS, that is for the anterior limb of the internal capsule. So the ALEC or BCBS target is allowed uh, in OCD. Uh, the psychiatrist, however, who I uh, like to work with, they say they think it is still in an experimental stage. So it's allowed, but they say it's experimental. So we can treat OCD patients if we um, try to do that in the framework of a scientific project, but uh, it is allowed to do so and you could do whatever you think uh, is, is necessary for the patient. Depression is a difficult other thing. Uh, we are only allowed to treat depression either if we do, um, if we do uh, single approaches to the uh, insurances. So, the, so we can basically medically do that. And we as a group uh, also do that in single cases um, if uh, those patients do for certain reasons not fit into our trials. But the bulk load of patients that we stimulate for uh, depression, especially with the target SMFP, we only do in a scientific framework. So that's we try to we try to protect that whole region in order to show to the outside we're not doing just anything because we think it works, but we have a scientific rationale that we follow. And we try a little bit from Freiburg, uh, Professor Schlepfer and me, we try to be the opinion leader of that for Germany and say need to do that in, in larger context with a larger volume and in a scientific framework in order to not lose data in all those patients. Okay. If there are no any other comments or questions, we should go further with the next lecture. It is long-term outcome for GPI DBS for dystonias and single center study in Patch Hungary experience of 60 cases, a review of the literature by Professor Balash. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, before uh, starting my presentation, uh, I would like to give you a, a review about the dystonia because it is a really disabling and uh, handicapping disease. And uh, no. As you can see, it's uh, characterized by an abnormal tonic muscle contraction resulted in a twisting or jerking of the body or, or body part. Uh, we all know that uh, this is not a new indication for deep brain stimulation because it has unlabeled uh, confirmation and accepted in the uh, Central European community and in the States since uh, 2003. So uh, the disease itself uh, characterized by involuntary phasic movements and uh, uh, the problem is with the patient the cognition is intact however the quality of life is disabled in view of uh, classification according to the etiology we can distinguish primary and secondary in origin in in primary dystonia the image especially the brain scan used to be normal and uh, mostly characterized and typical in adulthood. The secondary dystonia uh, in most cases shows pathology on images, on MR images. According to the onset, we can classify the disease early and late onset. Early means below age 20. And uh, this type is, uh, shows a tendency to generalization and mostly secondary in origin, the late onset after remains uh, focal, according to the experiences. Uh, according to the extent, we can also classify focal segmental hemi and generalized dystonia, which involves the whole body uh, muscles. We can also distinguish in view of prognosis, uh, the fixed and mobile type of dystonia, in fixed uh, dystonia, according to the uh, experiences, it is much less effective to DBS 
compared to the mobile type. If we would like to document the patient, we need international grading scales for severity, uh, Brukvam Marsden dystonia rating scale, and uh, for functions, uh, the DDRS scale, uh, which is a quality of life scale. And we can also apply the UPDRS similarly to Parkinson's disease and, and the video as well. The surgical target uh, today uh, mainly apply the GPI. It has been proved by multiple uh, studies in the past. The VOA and VOP in the thalamus is a potential target as well as the STM. Uh, we perform the surgery in general under general anesthesia. Uh, the traditional way we apply brain scan, adjust the trajectory, the target site. Uh, we prefer the proton density uh, MR uh, sequences because we can nicely see the border of the putamen, the, the pallidum, and also the internal portion and the posterior limb as a target of the GPI. And also we have to visualize the optic track because just on the bottom of the GPI, uh, there is the optic track, which is not uh, recommended to uh, danger or damage. We always apply the micro recording for this type of surgery, not exclusively the stimulation, especially because the patient is anesthetized. According to the micro recording, we measure exactly the length of the pathological activity. The anesthesia is a, a special kind of anesthesia because uh, if we have got a patient with generalized dystonia, it is not possible to uh, do on the local, otherwise uh, the patient would tear the head out of the frame. So for introduction, we prefer propofol and then switch to, to gas. Uh, we also cut off the muscle relaxation due to uh, the uh, checking of the internal capsule and the closeness of the internal capsule. So uh, during the uh, micro recording uh, session of the surgery, we have to achieve a so-called superficial anesthesia because if the patient sleeps uh, deeply, uh, no micro recording signals can be detected. What about the guidelines? So in case of uh, generalized segmental and cervical type, uh, according to the literature, the first choice is, is the DBS. The DBS is uh, extremely effective in focal type of dystonia, uh, torticolis, uh, lateral colis, etc. Uh, the other uh, symptoms uh, can also respond to the GPI uh, stimulation especially the tremor, but uh, limited data is available about the other focal dystonia. Uh, in MASH syndrome, the facial movement, uh, we also have uh, experience on this. DBS was effective. Very soon after the initiation of the stimulation, the symptom disappeared. And uh, it seems to be for writer's cramp, if the Botox uh, fails, the thalamic stimulation seems to be the better option. In case of secondary dystonia, the origin is, is different. The target type of dystonia is responding very well because the brain scan is normal. In case of other etiologies, trauma, Leshnayan, uh, myoclonus, cantocormia, ostanoxic, the results are not as good, but still work. In uh, juvenile dystonia, it's important to perform the surgery as soon as possible because the patient can develop very fast orthopedic complications, muscle contractions, joint contractions, and uh, you can perform the surgery, but it's very difficult. The patient needs long rehab uh, postoperatively uh, to achieve a good result. Uh, status dystonicus is a special uh, type of dystonia. It's a life-threatening condition. Sometimes we can prove the evidence of provoking factors like infection or stress. And uh, the pallidotomy 
uh, is also a good option uh, for this type of surgery. This is a 10 years old uh, child who was known to have uh, iron deposition inside the brain stem in the basal ganglia. He was known to have a Hallam Fordanch pulse disease. And uh, after having an uh, infection, he developed this type of generalized dystonia and uh, bone fracture related to the dystonia. So we had to ventilate the patient, relax, and uh, since there was no effect, we went uh, and uh, proceeded the operation. And after the surgery, the patient uh, uh, symptoms partially responded, and uh, we could let the young boy back home to his family. Uh, the prognostic factors are important. The etiology, uh, as I mentioned, the primary type responds much better. The DYT1 chromosome defect uh, responds very good. And uh, uh, the mobile type responds better than the fixed. And also the normal MR scan uh, seems to be a good prognosis. Uh, in view of cognition, According to the previous findings, there was no deterioration and the mood improved and also the quality of life. There is a nice uh, review about the dystonia studies. Uh, according to the keywords, uh, deep brain stimulation and dystonia, the Folkman team collected from the PADMED the database and looked through the previous uh, data. The heterogeneous uh, outcome was observed. They proved the evidence that dystonia primary responded better. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. yes. Perfect. Uh, okay. Because I lost your screen. Uh, and uh, I, I can see you. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the target dystonia responded better according to this review, uh, as I have previously uh, mentioned. Good candidates were the patient who had the inherited type, such as DYT1 uh, chromosome aberration. And uh, also the idiopathic segmental type was responding better than the generalized and also the tardif type. The orofacial uh, type related to DYT6 aberration was less uh, predictable compared to the previous one. So the dystonia was mostly effective for th those patients who had isolated dystonia and for those who had combined disease like uh, hypotonia, ataxia and other symptoms had less uh, good prognosis. Uh, this is just a review of the literature as if you can see the number of the operated patients. Uh, uh, the page team had uh, at that time in 2012 a relatively uh, high number of patients compared to the multi-centric studies. It was a single center study. And now I will switch to our personal experiences. Uh, it's about uh, five years uh, long-term uh, follow-up. Uh, and we wanted to see what's happening in long time after the surgery. We operated 60 patients between 2001 and 16, a relatively young uh, patient, if you see the age and gender, and mainly uh, the most patient had primary dystonia and less secondary. Uh, we apply different rating scale to see the severity and the disability according to the, uh, these scales, the quality of life, the mood, and the cognitive function. We recall the patient uh, for follow-up every year annually, and uh, we redo this type of uh, inventories, and then static statistically analyze the results. What show the results? At five years, the distant disability rating scale showed a 42% improvement and the rating scale 41%. So it was as so I go back, the 50, 22% improvements mean significant. So it was more than significant in a long-term time. 
If we distinguish the primary and secondary dystonia, the primary is the red and the secondary uh, is the blue one, we could achieve a significant improvement in primary and insignificant uh, secondary dystonia, very similar as the international data has found. Uh, in view of quality of life, if you can see the SF36 the visual scale and EQ5D also significantly improved in a long term time. And uh, if we would see just exclusively the EQ5, also significant improvement was proved in both roofs, not only in the primary uh, historic. And uh, this is uh, about the result of the mood and cognition. Basically, in long term time, we did not find any change in mood and cognition. And this is uh, another primary generalized type of dystonia. We have uh, operated uh, more than 10 years ago. At that time, this young lady was age of 20 and she was really disabled uh, without uh, support. She was not able to do anything. The mother continuously had to look after her. And as you can see, just after the surgery, she was independent. Uh, she hardly could go back to the normal, normal life. The only problem was the muscle uh, contraction. So she could have, uh, after the surgery, some difficulties in walking. But otherwise, she was independent compared to the preoperative condition. So in summary, we can tell that in, in our series, we have had uh, 60 cases, but today we have got uh, 98 cases. Statistically, it has not been analyzed, but in long term, uh, the result of the DBS was uh, good enough. And uh, uh, we found uh, the similar findings. The primary was more responding, and uh, we have proved that uh, this intervention has a high impact of, on quality of life and no change in uh, mood and cognition, and we could maintain this result on a long-term time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Bauer, for the interesting presentation, and congratulations for the wonderful clinical results. Are there any questions from the colleagues? Professor Kionan, please. Thanks, Dr. Balish, for this very beautiful presentation. I have a question. We sometimes see patients who have um, who have initially responded very well to GPI stimulation with uh, uh, you know more than one segment of of, of dystonia, maybe maybe like Marsh syndrome, and then some form of cervical dystonia and torticollis. And sometimes they lose efficacy to that secondary part. What is your experience with doing additional GPI electrodes, doing additional maybe STN electrodes in those patients? Basically, uh, since we implanted the device into the GPI, we never had the opportunity to implant a second one. Uh, thank you for this idea, uh, especially for secondary dystonia, would be worse to extend with an additional electrode. But uh, uh, up till now, we don't have experience on this field. Any other questions or comments? If they are not, we are going further with the next presentation. It is DBS in Dystonia, first clinical cases by some progress from North Korea. So, yeah. Dr. Denisova, could you turn down your loudspeaker a little bit? I think we have like a, a back firing. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. So my my second uh, my second presentation is about uh, clinical cases, some interesting clinical cases uh, cases from our practice of DBS in dystonia. Uh, so, first clinical case is about patient with dystonic tremor. So, that patient was uh, 44 years old and he was dentist. So, it was important to have stable hands for him. 
and he has a diagnosis segmental dystonia and dystonic tremor of the right hand and the head. Symptoms onset uh, was at the age of 19, and he took 10 milligrams of baclofen two times a day and one milligram of clonazepam. And here you can see uh, when he was trying to write his name and to draw the so main features of dystonic tremor are associated dystonic posture, irregular amplitude and frequency, usually less than 7 Hz, and postural and intentional tremor rather than resting tremor. So it can help to differentiate this kind of tremor from, for example, Parkinsonian or essential tremor. And uh, uh, when this patient came to us, we were thinking, uh, about the target, which can be optimal for him. So uh, we were choosing between GPI, VIM, uh, ventral oral uh, posterior nucleus, and zona inserta. And so uh, finally, we decided to try two targets simultaneously, uh, VIM and GPI uh, on the left side. And uh, so we did our surgery under local operation to check clinical effects. And uh, what we saw during surgery, you can see now uh, it's beam stimulation is on. And uh, you can see that he can write his name really clearly and he doesn't have any tremor in his hand. And uh, well, I really hope that the video is not lagging. And now we switched off WIM stimulation and uh, yeah, you can see that tremor came back. Um, so we discovered that uh, during surgery, GPI stimulation uh, didn't give any, um, any clinical effects. So it didn't give neither tremor control nor side effects. So we decided to put electrode in, in it. And beam stimulation gave good tremor control. And yeah, as you can see, patient could write his name. So this, this is our planning behind VIM. And this video after surgery, when our neurologist started to stimulate different targets, uh, just for interest. So here's GPI stimulation on the video and uh, you can see that it has some effect, so the patient can write at least, but he still have these uh, jerky movements of the hand. And when we switched on VIM stimulation, uh, hand be, uh, became more stable, but you can see this dystonic posture of the hand. And finally, uh, our neurologists uh, switched uh, on both targets, and uh, the patient uh, yeah, got stimulation of GPI and VIM simu simultaneously. And uh, to the moment of discharge, you can see this uh, paper uh, with trials of patients, and you can see smooth spiral. Um, so, yeah, and uh, we decided that these kind of patients with dystonic tremor, uh, they sh uh, we should uh, say, think twice what target to, uh, to, to choose, because in the literature, um, there are a lot of papers about GPI and only some of them ab about beam, and only just several cases about simultaneous stimulation of both targets but maybe if, if this patient had problems with both sides, maybe it will be more complicated decision. So this is another uh, clinical case. This patient is a uh, female, 21 years old, and she has diagnosis generalized fixed dystonia and deep one negative. So it's secondary dystonia. And uh, she had a strong spasticity in her trunk and limbs. Uh, here you can see uh, the patient before uh, ITB implantation. Uh, so when we firstly first time uh, saw this patient, 
that she had a lot of spasticity and this spasticity was fixed. Uh, we decided to uh, start with a uh, Baclofen test, Baclofen trial, and um, uh, this trial was very successful. And after that, we decided to implant ITB, Baclofen pump, and got uh, really good clinical effect on the dose of 110 micrograms per day. And after surgery, patient was able to walk and study at the university show. So she became independent. Uh, but in 2017, all symptoms came back and patient came to, uh, to intensive care unit in Estonicus. Uh, Baclofen dosage was increased to 600 micrograms a day, but uh, we, uh, patient didn't get any improvement. And then we injected the contrast to the catheter port, and we discovered that uh, our catheter went out from subarachnoid space. And so we re implanted the catheter, but uh, it has good but temporary effect. And to 2019, ITB therapy effect became really poor with very high dosages and side effects, and patient became bedridden again. So in February 220, we decided to implant DBS, uh, GPI bilaterally, um, additionally to work in pump. And here the patient on the fifth day after, uh, after surgery, so we just uh, switched on stimulation. So you can see that the effect is quite good. And uh, here are two videos from this September. This patient came to us, I think, one week ago. And uh, yeah, he, you can see that uh, some problems came back to her with posture and uh, trunk. And yeah, but, but they resolved uh, after programming, I mean, after correcting parameters of, of stimulation. So a uh, pump now is working still, uh, but the dosage is quite small. I think about 100 grams a day, which is small for this, for this particular patient. Uh, we are a little bit afraid to remove pump, uh, at least now. So we will wait probably uh, till stable DBS effect and then maybe uh, remove pump. Here's the third clinical case. This is a child, a uh, male, 10 years old. Um, so he had uh, dystonia, uh, did one early onset, torsion dystonia. So disease onset was at the age of eight, and he took 20 milligrams baclofen per day and Botox injections every four or five months. And actually without Botox, he couldn't even sit, and he was really bad ridden. So this video is before DBS, uh, it's a little bit accelerated. Um, so you can see this torsion of the body and the jerky movements of all limbs. So uh, for this child, it was even hard to sit and uh, walk, of course. And here, the fifth day, uh, after surgery, so we switched on stimulation. So it became able to walk uh, for him. But still, there, there are uh, a lot of jerky movements in limbs. And this is a patient after one month after stimulation onset. So you can see that uh, in the limbs, there is st there still uh, some dystonic posture, but anyway, he can do really small and smooth movements, which were uh, impossible be before DBS. Um, there are some considerations uh, about DBS for pediatric dystonia. Uh, so in Russia, it's allowed to do DBS in children only from seven years. I know that in Germany uh, that uh, they have early their age. Uh, so positive outcome predictors is primary, did one positive dystonia. And from secondary forms, tardive dystonia is a very good uh, responsive 
uh, DBS. And negative outcome predictors, fixed skeletal deformities and timing. The uh, shorter the duration of dystonic symptoms, the better the outcomes. But there are still some concerns about the possible negative effects on the developed, uh, developing central nervous system, some ethical issues that a uh, child cannot decide for himself uh, about this kind of surgery, uh, anesthetic challenges, uh, lack of normative data on pediatric DBS, which, is, uh, which age is uh, minimal for surgery, what stimulation parameters uh, we should use, because it's not clear uh, if it's possible to use the same parameters as in adults. And uh, post-operative infection rate reported uh, much higher than in adults, so uh, it reached uh, 40%, and hardware removal in about a third of patients. And the last clinical case, uh, this is a man, uh, 31 years old, he has severe torsion dystonia, and he had a disease onset at the age of 20. And uh, for these 11 years, he had already fixed spine deformity, scoliosis. And this is a video before DBS. So you can see really strong torsion of the body, and he cannot even see where he's going, actually, because of these movements. So most of the time he just spent uh, staying at home and uh, doing nothing. And this video is uh, on the fifth day after switch after DBS. Well, at least posture became better, and he can uh, look directly. I'm sorry. Yeah, and this one month after DBS. So you can still see uh, the deformity, yeah, because it's fixed already. But anyway, patient feels much better. And this video is for four months after DBS implantation. Yeah. And uh, there are some conclusions. Uh, so patients with medically refractory forms of dystonia should be referred for consideration of DBS, including children. Uh, early surgery can help to avoid joint and vertebral deformities, and uh, sometimes combination of targets, uh, for example, beam and GPI or modalities uh, like DBS and ITB can improve clinical effect. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Denisova, thank you so much for sharing with us your interesting clinical pictures. Uh, I suppose that Professor Balash will have some comment or some questions because he has a great experience. I just would like to congratulate you for this nice presentation. Uh, I just would like to give some comments on, on your presentation. Uh, it has been proved that over each seven for pediatric indication, the surgery can be performed, the PBS implantation, because the size of the brain more normal as an adult. Uh, so uh, the strategy in our department is that we place uh, two contacts deeper along the trajectory, the electrode, because in case the brain grows, uh, you don't need a replacement of the electrode. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other option is uh, responsiveness. If, if the patient uh, operated and you apply the patient, you don't see any improvement uh, in the OR for the stimulation trial, just we can see the side effects because uh, years or not years but months goes by until the stimulation effect can be estimated. So we don't know exactly why, but we have to wait after the initiation of the stimulation at least three months to see the final results. If you are not happy with the results, you have to recall back the patient as you have did it and uh, change the stimulation parameter. 
I don't know what are your parameters. You you uh, mentioned the second case. You have changed the parameters because the patient had a deterioration mm -hmm. after a good response. Uh, we provide the more than 20 pulse bits, 130 hertz stimulation parameters, and if it's possible, the unipolar type of uh, stimulation. What's your point? Uh, the point about second patient was that right after surgery, when I started stimulation, uh, it was possible only to do bipolar stimulation from both sides because I got a lot of side effects from uh, capsula, most of them, and uh, it was, uh, how to say, it was necessary to do only bipolar. And now when she was increasing uh, the voltage of stimulation, um, she, she got uh, some capsular response again. And when she came, we just changed contacts and we started unipolar stimulation. And yeah, we hopefully uh, she will, uh, how to say it, um, she will doing better now. Thank you and congratulations again. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Any other comments? Professor, can you try to say something to our No, I just wanted to, I was just, I was just Sorry. putting my head and saying that's great results. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. So now we are approaching the end of our symposium with the final presentation of Professor Norbert Kovac, the impact of a lot of new deep brain stimulation techniques on the treatment of drug resistant movement disorders. Thank you very much. Uh, again, the invitation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm okay. Uh, I don't know the other participants. So I would like to talk about uh, how the technology can change our lives. I'm quite happy that uh, I'm specialized in movement disorders and working with uh, um, deep brain stimulation because it, it's a very successful story. We can help the majority of our patients if you have a good patient selection, if we have an accurate neurosurgeon with accurate uh, and precise DBS lead locations. We have an optimal DBS programming and we have a good management system. So I think the outcome can be very uh, improving and uh, can be very effective in our patients. In the recent years, the technologies have been changed and I just wanted to highlight some concepts which has been dramatically uh, evolved in the last couple of years. When we talk about deep brain stimulation, we have to know that it's a very unique technique because it, we can simultaneously use low frequency or high frequency stimulation. If we use most of the cases high frequency stimulation, that can, we don't know the exact way, but probably with, uh, as Professor Conan had mentioned, by the axonal jamming, we can produce functional inhibition but we can also uh, do ex uh, functional excitation if we use low frequency stimulation. So the same technique can be used for enhancing missing um, phenomenon or we can inhibit a pathological overactivity. Long ago, when this technique has been uh, established in 1986, we used a, a car, uh, most of the cases electrode with four different contacts and we use two basic stimulation techniques the monopolar and bipolar stimulation monopolar stimulation is one of the most common stimulation mode when the case of the pulse generator is the positive and the electrode is the negative this monopolar stimulation mode delivers a very spherical distribution of uh, electrical activation which results in larger volume of tissue activated, and that's why consequently lower energy is needed to achieve the efficacy. On the other hand, in case of side effects, we use bipolar stimulation mode, which is more focused, which has a less side effect, but most of the cases require larger energy. When I started deep brain stimulation, I was told that the negative contact stimulation is what we have to do. 
But in the recent years, we got a couple of studies. At the moment, it's, it's only on case series or just high uh, pivotal studies that not the negative, but the positive stimulation, the uh, analytic stimulation can be also uh, feasible. And in many of the cases, analytic stimulation might have less stimulation related side effects. So this is one paradigm which we learned, let's say three or four decades ago, may be changing. The other is what we usually learn when we um, initiate the DBS program from the very ancient and very uh, basic studies that we learn that there are some uh, well-established um, parameters. Most of the cases we use 130 Hertz stimulation because this is the best efficacy, but it can also not so high that we can uh, deploy the battery much faster. And we, in most of the cases, use 60 microseconds pulse width as a, a rule of thumb. But recently, we learned that low frequency stimulation, not as low below 30, but uh, let's say uh, 60 or 80 hertz stimulation may be more effective than the 130 hertz that we used prior. And further studies are required that whether it's meaningful or not on a long-term basis. We also tried in a couple of patients, one of them uh, improved a lot. In some of the patients did not have an additional benefit, but more or less, I'm looking forward, but we'll be to discuss whether which is the best optimal frequency for Parkinson's disease. We also learned, as I mentioned, that 60 microseconds as a rule of thumb is, is good for S10 stimulation because uh, that gives <clears throat> the best outcome. This is <clears throat> what we learned from Elena Moro's study published in 2002 in the neurology. But Professor Folkman in Würzburg has demonstrated that 60 microseconds is sometimes too much. We can shorten the pass width, let's say 50, 40, or 30, and that's why we can increase the therapeutic window, reduce the side effect, and remain the same therapeutic efficacy. So this is one concept which also might be changing our uh, technique how to program the patients. When we started, there was only one company who provided deep brain stimulation systems and we delivered constant voltage systems. It's good for <clears throat> and the neurosurgeons, but it's sometimes very bad for the neurologist because uh, the, not the voltage, but the current which is delivered uh, produces the efficacy of the system. If the therapeutic impedance changes, then even though it we deliver the same voltage level, uh, what will happen? If the impedance level remains the same over years, let's say the volume of tissue activated remains the same. If the impedance became lower or decreases, the volume of tissue activated is increases and that can produce side effects in the clinical practice. If what is the most common in clinical practice that uh, some gliosis over the electrode develops over years and that's why the impedance increases. And if we deliver the same voltage level, what will happen? The volume of tissue activated is decreasing and the efficacy of our stimulation is vanishing. So this is what we have to Keep in mind when we program the patients, and this is a very nice and also very old study which was uh, published by Professor McIntyre, that even in, let's say, a first 50 or 60 percent of change in the um, impedance value can dramatically reduce the volume of tissue activated. So this is something we have to keep in mind. Uh, what is the conclusion? The new devices, including the Boston Scientific, the newer Medtronic, and all the all new Abbott system, delivers constant current level. And with the constant current uh, stimulation mode, we don't have to take care of the 
impedance and we can give a constant and more reliable uh, stimulation for our patients. So this side was just missing. The recent years, let's say 10 years ago, new stimulation mode, the so-called interleaving stimulation mode was developed. The old confesh, um, convenient ways, what we had when we added uh, another, a second or a third contact, we had to use the same pulse width, we had to use the same amplitude with the new interleaving stimulation mode. Uh, these technical limitations are um, gone, so we can use different pulse width and also different amplitude values. And I think it, it, it was very advantageous, and we published a couple of data that, uh, especially in Estonia, uh, the interleaving stimulation mode, when we can combine bipolar stimulation mode with monopolar universal motion uh, modes, for instance, is more effective than uh, the standard stimulation mode, even though it has some side effects because uh, it requires more energy. And I will go come back later. That's why we need uh, rechargeable devices. We published some data case series. Those dystonia patients who did not respond with monopolar stimulation mode, double monopolar stimulation mode, when we changed to interleaving stimulation mode, they improved dramatically. Especially in Guyane onset dystonia, uh, the rechargeable devices became very important because previously in dystonia patient, we had to re uh, replace the batteries in every two or three years. But with the invention of rechargeable devices, uh, these devices last for 15, 20, or 25 years. And not just uh, the loss of the need for replacement of the batteries, but also the devices became much smaller. And if we look at a young boy who have this tone, it's, it's very important that the size of the devices became by half. Uh, the next invention, I think, it was initiated in five years ago, and in many of the conferences, it was invented as as one of the major breakthrough was the development of segmented loops, uh, segmented contacts. If we have a very good neurosurgeon who plays the electrode in the right spot, we are very easy job as a neurologist to program the patients. But if even if a slight half a millimeter or one millimeter <clears throat> uh, off target is uh, happening, we might. Uh, get in trouble producing some stimulation-related side effects. So that's why the segmented or the directional leads, which were invented a couple of years ago, changed our uh, practice. For instance, with uh, many of the uh, segmented leads, we have the option that we can uh, focus the uh, direction of the stimulation to avoid uh, the capsular side effects, for instance, like you know, this uh, um, semantic drawing. There are lots of data which has been published in the last five years. This is, was, I think, the first among which was published by Professor Folkman that uh, segmented leads have the same efficacy as the ring mode, but what is very different is that the therapeutic window can be widened. And what we can see that uh, we can, that's why reduce the side effects of the patients. Many uh, publication has been published on this topic, not just in the uh, private studies, but also large ongoing uh, multi-center trials are uh, aiming at uh, the usefulness of the segmented uh, Leads. I don't know if this video, the sound will work. Hopefully, it works. Can you hear the sound? No. I I'm sorry. Um, probably it's a technical problem. This is a PD patient who was operated six months prior, and we programmed relatively low one and a half milliamps in a segmented mode. The patient had no speech problem. 
if we turn on to the ring mode, which was the conventional stimulation mode, the patient had a speech problem. And this is, I think, the most important advantage of the segmented electrodes that we can reduce the side effects. And what was very surprising for me, that recently it was published, that not just the side effects can be improved or, or, or uh, can be reduced, but because we uh, stimulate much more uh, much less surface. That's why the therapeutic cure and strength, which is the reward, can be reduced. So what does it mean? Not just the upper border of the therapeutic window increases, which is good for the patients because we have less stimulation-related side effects, but also the lower border of the therapeutic window is decreasing, which means that lower energy is required to achieve the same efficacy. The last part I want to talk about is that the patient programmers. Um, let's say 15 years ago, the patient was able to increase and decrease the amplitude, but had no feedback on the stimulation. With the new devices, uh, the patient has much more control. The patients can increase or decrease the amplitude of stimulation, which is very beneficial to improve, for instance, the early morning dystonia or some of periods. And also very important, especially in case of dystonia, that we can pre-program one, two, three, or four different programs. We don't have an immediate efficacy on dystonia. So I, most of the cases, I program three or four different programs. The patient go home after the operation and with a um, telephone conference or a telephone visit, we can discuss that he or she can't change the stimulation without coming back to the office. The last topic I want to um, mention is, I think, in the near future, this is called adaptive stimulation. Medtronic, one of the largest companies, has uh, developed and invented, and at least in Europe, um, it's uh, a theme marked a new a uh, stimulator which can not just stimulate, but also can record the local field potentials. And with this uh, uh, technique, they can have the promise that in the near future, the closed loop or relative stimulation can be delivered. What does it mean? In many of the patients, we don't have to use 24 hours seven day a week stimulation. We can turn on the stimulator only if uh, the symptoms worsen. And probably this will be the future that uh, based on the local field potentials, the stimulator can adapt the stimulation settings based on the need and the actual need of the patients. So what is the future of deep brain stimulation? Probably more indications, especially the uh, depression, the dementia might be an indication for deep brain stimulation. We might have a better targeting. We ha might have a smaller, smarter devices, which require less invasive technology. They can be much more intelligent for programming and they can have a higher efficacy and better side effect profile. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, Professor Kovac, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. It's a wonderful uh, final of the symposium. Finding the trends of the in the DBS treatment. Any comments or questions concerning the lecture? Professor Kovac. Yeah, can I ask you some provocative question? Uh, for example, if you have a patient uh, which uh, which is really difficult to uh, stimulate, I mean, to, uh, how to say, uh, to find parameters which are good for this patient. And uh, you don't see any good effect, just side effect, and from this contact, from this contact, and, uh, and uh, uh, will you, uh, what will you do? And uh, do you have any cases maybe when, uh, because of the absence of good clinical effect, uh, you had to re-implant your electrode. 
or you just try programming again and again, trying some other parameters and so on. Thank you very much for this question. Um, I think what is a uh, very lucky situation at this team page that we have a very good and very experienced neurosurgeon. So we don't have too many uh, cases when uh, what we face that uh, uh, we don't have a good outcome. Most of the cases, immediately after the operation, we do perform postoperative CTs or MRIs. So basically, we know that the director is on the right spot. Um, we had some difficult cases, especially post-traumatic uh, tremor cases. When the lead migrated, we had to re-implant. We also saw a couple of patients who was operated, not in our center, but uh, had a um, limited improvement and that we find out that the electrode was not in the right position. I think the one and only choice that you can do is reevaluate the patient and replace the electrode in the right spot, if that was the question. We also had a couple of patients, we had a tertiary center, so, and many of the PD patients or dystonia patients who was operated nationwide come here here to look for uh, reprogramming, sometimes reprogramming or just uh, taking that this patient was operated in another center, we uh, always perform the primary testing again, and we check which contact has the best efficacy. And I think if you have a trouble, you don't have a limited outcome, you can do this uh, in the first you can do a post-operative C to MRI to look for the localization of the electrode if it's in the right spot. You have to retest all the electrode. Make, um, sometimes the, what you stimulate at the moment is not the best. And if you have a better, then you can change and reprogram. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Kovac. Thank you, Dr. Gunisla. Now it's time for, uh, for the closing remarks of this symposium. I would ask all of our faculties to say some words, something like a take home message or something like a closing remarks or something like a advices for the future. Uh, let's restart this time uh, with the uh, uh, not alphabetical order. Let me start with Professor Kovac. I would like to also thank for the invitations and, and I would like to also congratulate you that you established your centers and it's evolving. I think the most important take home message is that you should uh, operate the patient on the right time. And sometimes this right time is earlier than the conventional DBS optimal time at the moment. So I'm try thinking earlier for dystonia to prevent social occupational problems to prevent secondary deformities, uh, in Parkinson's disease to preserve the patient's working abilities and also uh, the social life. So I think the take home message is that we have to find the right patient on the right time, sometimes earlier than we think of. Thank you, Professor Kovac. Uh, Dr. Denisova, your final words, please. Um, well, first of all, of course, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. For me, it was really useful and uh, I will definitely give these uh, uh, lectures to uh, hear more my colleagues, especially for my neurologist, uh, because uh, the last lecture was really interesting and uh, I think that we didn't even try to change uh, frequency or uh, like uh, pulse width in our patients. So maybe it's a good idea to try now. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this symposium. Professor Kionen, could you please say some words, some final words? Yeah, I'm very honored to be be part of this. So thanks again uh, to you, Professor Enchev, to to invite me. Um, uh, I think you're all doing, uh, if I might say so, brilliant work. Uh, you, my, most of you are already very, very experienced, so there's nothing. I, I can see a very, very nice evolution based on scientific proof 
uh, for the neurosurgeons amongst us, I would just say, make sure uh, your frames are precise and make sure that you, you know, get the best and accurate targeting for your neurologist because that's going to make their lives uh, a lot better and uh, and that's going to add to um, the quality of this uh, and the acceptance of this treatment. So that would be my advice, precision, precision and accuracy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Balash, it's your turn now. Yeah, thank you. I just would like to express my congratulations for organizing this nice conference and webinar. Uh, in surgical point of view, my take home message would be the, the next uh, answer. Uh, whichever technique will be available in the future, segmented electrodes, uh, special uh, stimulation modes, if the electrode is off target, whatever you can do, it will never work. So don't hesitate if there is no therapeutic effect, just re-estimate the position of the electrode. If it needs to change, do it and the patient will be much better. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Dr. Tsalta, could you say some few words? We are working together like a team with our neurologists. Mainly, I uh, would like to thank uh, for all the speakers for sharing their uh, experience with us and for uh, supporting us uh, with uh, the start of the work of our center. And uh, I would completely join uh, Professor Norbert uh, Kovac for uh, this, that the most important part is the selection of the patient at uh, the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tauta. Now I would like to invite Professor Tonchev, the head of our scientific research institute, uh, who is a really significant neuroscience scientist with a lot of publications, a lot of citations, to say some words for the some closing yes, thank you, Amor. And uh, I would like to, to thank uh, all the participants for having the time to to attend uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, I hope, well, we were planning this uh, to be a live event, of course, with Yavor, but it was not possible due to the uh, COVID pandemic. However, um, we have plans and uh, we are going to contact you further on uh, when this develops and when traveling is possible, perhaps, uh, to visit us live in Varna, we have funding for this. So not only now for this event, for which I contacted you by email, and I will contact you in the next days um, personally, but also for future events. And we hope this will be possible to be done on site or that um, perhaps in the future you can, uh, we can send uh, uh, somebody in your uh, department, in your labs, uh, to visit when, when traveling is possible. Uh, so, um, I believe this is just uh, a first step, but, uh, you know, uh, a very long journey begins with a small step. So, uh, thanks again for participating, and we are looking forward to further developing the collaboration. Thank you, Professor Tonchev. So, my last words. Uh, unfortunately, you are not here in Varna on site, but next year, well, we are the host of the Bulgarian Society of Neurosurgery annual meeting. So, I will be very glad to invite all of you to take a part in this meeting. I hope in Varna. We will try to organize it in the end of summer or in the early uh, beginning of uh, autumn when the weather is fine. So, you are invited with your families, with your beloved. To enjoy the the annual the scientific event, to enjoy the the Varna, which is the city capital of Bulgaria. Thank you so much for your participation, for the excellent level of your lectures. It was really very useful, especially for me and for the the colleagues of my team. Uh, congratulations. So, uh, what is the conclusion? So the right doctor with the right patient with the right treatment, excellent results. But it, it looks so easy, but thanks to you, we are trying to do our best. So thank you once again. Have a wonderful day. And I hope that we'll see you together in Varna and to, to make a real, not a coffee drink, but something more different, probably. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, you. thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Тони, как мислиш? Ало? Ало, Тони? Чуваш ли? Да, сега те чувам, да. Протечи гладко, казва много добре. Аз проверих и канала. Вървеше в YouTube. Да. Да, да. През цялото време. Нивото на лекциите беше впечатляващо. Аз съм много доволен. Просто лекциите бяха страхотни. Нивото е много високо. Колегите са много високо ниво. Германията е. Трябва да помислиш как, как би могло да се продължи това нещо. Да. Ами. Аз предполагам, че никой не би отказал. Може да не е с, дали с някой от тях само пак да е знам онлайн, доколко е, доколко е полезно това. Или ами... по време на операция да бъдат включени онлайн. Да, сам знаеш, че онлайн за лекция, но иначе за workshop и за практическата работа има нужда от визити. А наистина, струва си пече фантастичен център и Фрайбург трябва да се ходи там. Но... Колко се може повече хора за по-дълъг период от време, така мотивиране, съзнание. Започнахме. Благодаря ти. Ти си основният така мотор и поздравям, защото без, без теб трудно ще, ще стане всичко и, и финансиране. И така. Благодаря, Томи. Ами, ще да. действам, аз ще се погрижа вече, че ще им бъдат изпратени договори. Добре. Почтенски адреси ще ми трябва, на които да изпратим. Аз ще пиша по имейл. Добре, добре, това ми благодаря. Успешен ден. Благодаря. Чао, чао.